We're recording. Thank you. Good evening. It's September 9th, 20, 2024. Mm -hmm. And this is a regular meeting of the Amherst Town Council. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely or in a mixed mode like we are tonight. What, as long as we are able to provide adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media Channel 9 and through their live stream. Actually, in fact, there are eight counselors in this room, as well as audience. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the September 9th regular town council meeting to order at 6.32. I'll call upon each counselor by the name they have indicated they would like to be addressed. At that time, please unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that we can hear you and you can hear us. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. I'll begin with Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Counselor Ette. I have no record yet. Lynn Griesmer is present. Counselor Haneke. Present. Bob Hagner is absent. Councilor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Councilor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Here. Alicia Walker. Here. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Walker. Um, there is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena or me know. Athena is the clerk of the town council. If you wanna make a comment or ask a question, use the raised hand button. If technical difficulties arise, we will decide what to do with that at that time, including the possibility of having to pause the meeting. Um, Athena will be monitoring our various connections. With regard to the order of the agenda, we will have a presentation on Valley Green Energy as we conclude the announcements. And the discussion regarding the town manager's goals will follow the action items. There will be one general public comment period during the meeting. Can we put the announcements up on the board starting with those upcoming council meetings? We have a council meeting on the 23rd. This is a meeting where we focus in part on the master plan. This is a requirement of the charter. The charter requires that we hold a public forum on the master plan once a year. We begin that meeting at 5.30 with a primer on the master plan, and then at six o'clock with the actual public forum. At 6.30, the council will convene its regular meeting. I'd also like to mention that on September 28th at nine o'clock, uh, there will be a four towns meeting in the regional middle school. Uh, upcoming council meetings have shifted around a bit. Uh, uh, for instance, CRC is meeting tomorrow and on the 24th at 6.30. Uh, GEO Finance Committee is not meeting until further notice. Uh, I'm sure they'll meet in October. GOL is meeting on the 26th at 6.30, unless they decide they don't need the meeting. And Town Services and Outreach is probably meeting on September 12th this week at 10 o'clock. There are a couple other quick announcements I'd just like to call your attention to, and we're gonna put those announcements up on the screen. The first is the Downtown Amherst Design Standards. These are events that will be taking place on September 13th and 14th and we urge you to pre-register for them. You can do that by going to the town website. The events themselves will include something that, be, a walking tour that begins on the North Common, which was recently renovated, and then two different meetings that will be at the Amherst Pelham Regional High School. Middle, um, high school, high school cafeteria. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next is an open house at the Bang Center and the John Musanti Health Center. That's on Tuesday, the 17th at 5.30 to 
All of these, by the way, are in the packet for the council. The bid block party, which is a big event where many people from the town gather together. Uh, it is on September 19th from five to nine in the center of town, roads are blocked off. So please make note of that. And then there is a volunteer fair on Saturday, September 21st from 10 to one on the Amherst Town Common. With that, I would like to introduce Stephanie Ciccarella, our Director of Sustainability for the Town of Amherst. And she is going to provide us with an overview of the Valley Green Energy presentation and take questions. Stephanie. Thank you so much, Councillor Griesmer. And thank you, Town Councillors, for allowing me some time on your agenda to um, give an overview of this program and answer some of your questions. Um, it's very exciting that this has finally come to fruition. And so I'm happy to be able to present the information this evening. Um, I would ask if Athena, you could share the slide that I sent you. While you're doing that, I just want to make sure that Councillor Ate, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, so um, the, the Valley Green Energy Program will be officially launching on November 1st, and residents should have received a postcard in the mail alerting them to a letter that was coming. It was a two-page letter that was an informational sheet about the program. So in that letter, it describes the, the Valley Green Energy Program and what the options will be for residents. The first time that people will see any kind of change on their Eversource bill is going to be on the December bill. Um, the first question that people may ask is why did we choose to pursue becoming a community choice aggregation and why did we create Valley Green Energy in partnership with the communities of Northampton and Pelham? The main reason is that Choosing our own electricity supply gives us some control over what we can offer to our residents. Currently, if you are on Eversource basic service, the utility chooses that basic service. The communities have no control over what it is or the amount of green and renewable energy content that is in that electricity supply. This way, we were able to choose a supplier that would provide us a, a greener electricity content to our electricity supply at a reduced rate from currently from Eversource's basic rate. Also, it gave us the ability to offer other electricity choices with different content of renewable energy and different pricing. In addition, we were able to lock in the pricing for two years. So this pricing that you see is actually locked in until November of 2026. Eversource prices fluctuate every six months. So every six months, there's a change in the pricing. Now, right now, the pricing that we offer is uh, for the standard green that people are automatically basically enrolled in, if you are a basic service customer, is below the basic source, the basic service price from Eversource. We can't guarantee that that will continue throughout the entire program, but very likely for the most part, it will probably be, if not below the Eversource price, it will probably be very close to the Eversource price. So we just want people to know that this is stable and consistent pricing that we can offer through this program. So Eversource, um, Eversource defaults to their energy supplier for basic service. So as I mentioned, this gives us some options. So the options you see below uh, are three different options that currently have different content and they're different pricing. So automatically the Valley Green Energy Standard Green that's at 13.994 cents per kilowatt hour is what you will automatically be enrolled in if you have basic service. So if you receive an Eversource bill and you are on Eversource basic service, you will be automatically enrolled into this price and to this option. 
you will not have to do anything at all. It happens automatically. You don't have to contact anyone. You don't have to change anything. The other two options, the Valley Green Energy Basic is an option that has only the amount of renewable energy content that is required by law. This differs from the Valley Green Energy Standard Green in that the, the standard green pricing has 10% more green energy content, renewable energy content than what is currently being offered from the basic service. The Valley Green Energy 100% green is a bit more expensive and for those people where the pricing isn't so much the issue, but they really want to have 100% green content in their electricity supply, this is also an option. For either the Valley Green Energy Basic or the Valley Green Energy 100% green, you would have to either opt down to the basic or opt up to the Valley Green 100% green option. If you do not want to participate in Valley Green Energy at all, then you have to opt out. And I will get back to that, um, that information in a moment. So Athena, if you could scroll down to the next slide. Okay, so what you will see on your Eversource bill is a change in your electricity supply. So there are two major components of your electricity bill. One is about the distribution, which is what Eversource does and will continue to do and will continue to supply for you. Um, the other is your electricity supply. So that's the actual electricity supply. That is what is changing. We will now be getting our electricity supply from First Point, which will identify on your bill as First Point Valley Green Energy AMH. So that is what you will see in your bill. So again, if you have basic service, you don't have to do anything, you are automatically opted into this option. And they will again be the supplier until November of 2026. I just wanna say a little bit about the process and how we chose this particular supplier. We work with a consultant called Mass Power Choice. They did the work of finding, uh, putting out the RFP for finding electricity supply. And they came up with five potential options for the town and the town uh, towns of um, Pelham and Amherst, along with the city of Northampton worked together to choose an option that was, that would work for all three communities. Um, noting that Northampton actually is a national grid customer. So again, there are certain features about this program that we want to option, you know, really point out and emphasize. And the first is that you don't have to do anything. It's really important that people understand you won't get a separate bill or a different bill. You don't have to do anything if you're a basic service customer. If you are currently an Eversource customer and you want to opt out of this program, you just need to contact um, valleygreenenergy.org and I'll get back to that contact information in a moment. Other things I want to sort of note is that the um, sorry the um, anyone has solar. I know that this has been a question and a concern for people uh, in the community who have solar. There will not be any change to your solar. If you are a community solar participant, you have community solar. You will not. This will not affect your bill. Those rates that you pay or the, the payments that you make or the credits that you get or the checks that you receive are based on calculations that have nothing to do with your electricity supply at all. So there will not be any change. And in some cases, there might even be a benefit to be a Valley Green Energy customer um, as well as doing those programs. Not guaranteed, but there may be. So um, it does not affect that at all. So you can be in Valley Green Energy and it will not have any impact at all on your solar um, credits or your solar payments if you receive those. Um, if your energy goes out, if your electricity supply goes out, if we have a power outage, again, Eversource is still your go-to for any kind of distribution concerns. So if you lose power, if the community loses power, we go to Eversource. You don't do anything differently, that does not change. 
If you are someone who has um, a low, receives a low income discount, or you're on fuel assistance, you still get that benefit. There's no change to your benefit. So that will all stay in place. That's all the same. So um, the only thing that potentially uh, would be a change is for someone is on budget billing, um, it wouldn't apply to your supply charge and you would wanna contact um, the customer support on the front of, the, of this notice. You wanna contact that number for information about how to address that issue. So overall, the program we see is beneficial because we can offer our community residents stable supply for two years at a budget, a, a price that we think will help people budget their pricing and have stability for two years. It has greener content and there are more options. So that is, these are the main reasons why we decided to really pursue um, becoming uh, a community choice aggregation. And working with the communities of Pelham and Northampton, we're able to leverage having more customers that will benefit us in the long run and potentially offer us some opportunities in the future, hopefully for some programming, but that's down the road. So we won't get into that too much. Um, so that's pretty much the overview. I do wanna say that because uh, this particular presentation is really geared for questions from the town council that they, we are having information sessions for community members. The first one other than this is tomorrow, uh, which is Tuesday, September 10th. That will be held in the Bangs Center in the large activity room, which is located at 70 Boltwood Walk. And that will be from one to 2 p.m. That's in person. The next will be this Wednesday, September 11th during the ECAC meeting, they've dedicated 6.30 to 7.30 to be uh, an, an hour where we can go over the information and hear the similar information and um, community members can ask questions though we will have an opportunity for question and answer during that session. Um, and then the last session information session that we're officially sponsoring is a three community session where all three communities will be participating so Pelham, Northampton, and Amherst, it will be via Zoom and that will be held on September 26th from seven to 8 p.m. All of this information is on the town's website. There's a new news article and we also have uh, postings in the community calendar section of the town's calendar as well. Um, also, people are always welcome to contact me if they have any questions. And you can stop sharing the screen, Athena, and I'll answer any questions that council lawyers may have. Are there questions from the council? Uh, Kathy, you have your hand up. George did too, he just didn't use the little button. Right, I'll so, get to him, don't worry. Okay, so um, Stephanie, I think you, you basically answered my question, but I'm gonna ask it again um, because I think I will get questions. Um, and I'll use our household as an example. We um, have enough solar panels on our roof that we have a zero energy bill every month. And we get a check in addition to that from the SMART program. So, so the, pri the price that you're getting doesn't really matter to us, except that it looks like you're getting a guarantee of more of the electric electricity will be generated by green sources. So does that mean the major advantage of us joining the program and staying in the program is that our energy supply will be more green? So that's my question that otherwise, you know, my, my zero bill and my zero bill then gets zeroed out where we actually don't use the amount that we generate. So I've got this huge credit mounting that's computed on some Eversource per kilowatt hour that's somewhat less. So does that continue as we've seen it? It continues. It does not change that at all. It, they're, they're different. How that is all calculated has nothing to do with the amount of electricity that you're using. So you will, it doesn't change anything. You'll still get the same checks. You'll still get the same credits. That doesn't change. So the advantage to any household that's similar that already is getting this would be the energy supply is coming from, a, if we come with that standard that that 
the energy okay. supply itself, more of it's coming from a green source. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. George. So Stephanie, the uh, the prices for the other options, the uh, are they locked in for two years or are they variable? They are locked in for two years. All of the pricing that you see for Valley Green Energy is locked in until November, 2026. And can I ask you, how does one opt up or out? Or can you get into that now? Oh, actually, I apologize. Athena, I'm sorry. Can you put that um, slide back on that has the telephone number? I meant to go back to that, I apologize. That'll take me just a moment. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Um, so there's three ways that people can um, contact. They can call a telephone number, which Athena will show in a moment, but I will say out loud is 1-844-202-6033. And that's customer support for Valley Green Energy. People can also go to the Valley Green Energy website, which is valleygreenenergy, all one word, dot org. You can also contact customer support, which is support at valleygreenenergy, all, dot, all one word, dot org. So again, the information is here on the screen, the telephone number, and the website is valleygreenenergy.org. And those are the primary ways that you can have assistance. Any questions, they will answer any questions at all that anybody has, even if it's repetitive to what I'm saying and telling you. If you want to just make sure, if, you know, if you have any doubts or you're concerned and you want to call and talk to someone in the program, please feel free to contact uh, these folks. They're great. They'll um, answer your questions and have any concerns. And if you need assistance with opting into one of these other options, they will help talk you through it. Councillor Haneke. Yeah, two questions. One that follows up on what Kathy was asking and then a separate one. The separate one is about the opt-in and opt-outs and the two-year window. Um, many companies require you to only change at certain points in time. Um, maybe if you changed out of Eversource, you have to be there six months or you can't change more than once every other month or, you know, there's various requirements there. Um, is there a similar requirement that if a, a set of time where you have to opt out completely if you don't want this or when you have to opt into 100% green or basic or can you do that at any time within the two year cycle? What, what type of time frames are you limited to in all of these choices? So currently um, the opt out option is until um, October 2nd to, um, to opt out of these options but anyone can opt out at any time. And if anyone wa wants to opt back in, they can with no penalty. Um, we just can't guarantee the pricing will be exactly the same, but they can. people can opt out at any time and they can opt in at any time. Thank you. And for the question regarding solar panels, Kathy talked about an example where the person, uh, a household has solar panels that cover their entire year's electricity, electricity costs. Uh, many people don't. Uh, many people, it covers all of the summer costs, but then in the winter, they sort of, quote, draw down that um, the credit that was created in the summer and then also not just draw it down because there's charges on the bill, but then maybe still have to pay a bill. Um, what price is this if, if someone opts into Valley Green Standard or Valley Green 100? Is that the when say solar generation is 700 kilowatts, but your electricity usage is 800 kilowatts, what price is the the supply price that is charged under this for someone that's got that? And similar, if the generation is 700 kilowatts and the use is only 600 kilowatts, what price on either end of that, do any of these prices pertain to you? So again, if you're if you currently have solar and you're your on your bill your pricing is basically the eversource basic price then it's going to be standard green you're going to be in the standard green option so theoretically if you were a valley green customer and you at some point had to pay your bill you would be paying the valley green price not the eversource basic service price so, so and again, we can't guarantee that this price will always be below Eversource Basic Service, but at least for the next six months, we know it will be. 
But even so that means just just to try and make it clear for someone who has solar that offsets whatever energy usage it is, whether that number is a positive number or a negative number, the supply number that is charged against that number will be whatever one they opt into here, not some other, not the Eversource basic number. Correct. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, I should raise my hand, but Stephanie, um, is it my understanding because when people have surplus, they can donate it. Uh, is there still that option with Valley Green Energy? Yes, this doesn't change anything about any any of your solar arrangements, agreements, how it's set up. It's all the same, nothing changes. Okay. Are there other questions from the council? Then I'd like you like to remind people that there are other information sessions and you've been given all of the other information up here as to how to contact Valley Green Energy. They are the people to answer your questions. And there is a slide like that in your packet and on the public site for the town. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Have a good evening. Thank you all so much. Okay. Um, we're going to be moving to public comment. If you are in the audience and there are 28 attendees in on Zoom in the audience, that does not mean that there are not a lot more watching on TV or live stream. Uh, and if, or if you are in the town room, if you're in the town room, make sure you have signed up with Athena. She is over here. If you're in the audience, please raise your hand at this time if you would like to make public comment. I have five signed in here in the room. Okay, and we have six online. I'm going to, um, we'll, we'll go with three minutes, but I'm not going to pick up anybody else online or in the room uh, after we, at this point, we're cutting it at um, the number we have. If um, public comments on matters before the council, are only about those things within our jurisdiction. And I wanna stress, our jurisdiction does not include the University of Massachusetts, okay? Uh, residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. The First Amendment broadly protects individual rights to address the government, to speak and to express themselves, including their right to say hateful and offensive things. I am generally unable to shut those commenters down under the First Amendment to the US Constitution, unless their level of speech falls within an exception articulated by the courts, such as fighting words, true threats to a particular individual, harassment of a particular individual or incitement of imminent lawless activity. If a question exists as to whether a particular speaker is engaging in unprotected speech, I must defer to the principles of the freedom of speech. With that, we're going to begin with, you said there was five in the audience. I'm gonna begin with Mark Gilbert, who is on Zoom. Mark, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Well, oh, I'm, it's Nancy Gilbert. I'm using more. Hi, Nancy. Theater. Hi. Um, good evening, and thank you for providing this time for us to speak. Um, I'm Nancy Gilbert, and I live in District 4. I'm the former chair of the Amherst Board of Health, and I was involved when a proposal to amend um, and update the Board of Health regulations for refuse collection and recycling, which included the hauler bylaw that's coming being worked on in town began in 2021. 
I hope you all had a chance to read my written comments about that history. Now I'm speaking and I'm gonna keep it very brief as an individual in town. And I ask you to vote yes on the upcoming motion to have the manager use the RFP to local haulers so we can have cost information regarding the implementation of the waste hauler proposal. Although the council is not voting on it this evening, I support adoption of the original bylaw proposal that includes a town contract with a hauler with a pay as you throw fee structure and universal curbside compost pickup. I do this because of the impact it can have on climate change, air pollution, and thus public health. The National Resource Development Council in December of 2023 published a paper on compost as a climate solution. This adds support to a proposal and I'm just gonna quote a couple things from there. And this quote is, people often underestimate the impact that reducing food waste can have on climate change. Project, Bro Project Drawdown ranks reducing food waste as the number one on the list of most impactful interventions to mitigate climate change. Composting is one of the ways we can keep food scraps out of landfills, helping reduce landfill methane emissions. Compost can also help the climate by restoring the soil health." Uh, end quote. In the US, food is the most prevalent material in municipal landfills, compromising about 24% of landfill con tent in this was from 2018. We can extend our town's commitment to being a green community by providing our waste, by improving our waste and trash practices. Please vote yes on the TSO's recommendation to the town council. And thank you for providing this time for us. Thank you for joining us, Nancy. We'll go to the room, Athena. When you come forward, you're going to come forward to the mic. Make sure the green light is on or the mic is on and make sure you state your name and where you live. Carol James. It's, it's definitely on. Okay, <laughs> please be seated. <clears throat> Hi everyone, um, I'm Terrell James. Um, I am I am currently a resident from ha Northampton, but I go to UMass Amherst as a graduate student, um, and I was an Amherst resident um, about six years ago. Um, <clears throat> I am here today because I am the uh, the co-chair for the Graduate Employee Organization, which is the Graduate Worker Union at UMass. Um, we are currently in negotiations uh, with the university around a contract um, where our workers have been fighting for um, relief around housing. Um, I, I have been a person that has been working in this community for a long time. Um, <clears throat> I have students who I um, have work at Marks Meadows and Vela and other after school programs here in Amherst. Um, I have a lot of love for the city, the town of Amherst. I'm from Springfield, Massachusetts originally. Um, and a lot of my work is about, is about community partnerships at, um, with the university and um, <clears throat> in local communities in the area. Um, and so for me, what's really important to think about this is that, is that the university is currently um, you know, engaged in practices that are causing graduate students and graduate workers to have to take to take and live in places that are not suitable for living um, and that they can't afford. And I'm actually concerned about that because I also think that it actually puts the burden back on the people of Amherst, Northampton, Holyoke, Springfield as well. Um, because when, when graduate workers move into those towns and those areas, it actually inevitably ultimately raises the rent, raises prices. Um, and also graduate workers are having to, to do things that I think actually are, are like in problematic and, and, and actually in violation of like city ordinances. I know when I was a graduate worker here, I didn't know this at the time, but I ended up living in a house that had six other people in it. Um, that was a health violation. There was a lot of things wrong with that, that place. I wouldn't have done that if I knew that that was obviously against the, the town ordinance. Um, and if I knew that I had affordable places to live. Um, and so we currently are, are, you know, trying to negotiate with the university to figure out how can we actually have better housing? How can we have affordable housing? How can um, we make sure we're not putting this burden, put this burden back on to the town of Amherst? Um, and we don't want, you know, to, to cause any harm to any folks in Amherst. Um, a lot of our graduate workers live here in Amherst, um, have loved their time in Amherst. Some of our graduate workers stay here when they graduate because um, they love being in this area. Um, and so for us, you know, we currently have a petition um, where we're talking about, um, you know, having the university pay us a cost of living that will allow us to actually 
figure out and have better choices for housing. Um, and we can even, we're even gonna talk a little bit about like how we actually wanna see different types of housing being built to support graduate students, but that also meet the needs of the town of Amherst. We know that there's particular concerns about the way certain things have been built in Amherst, um, particularly Fieldstone. Um, and so we wanna invite you all to, to join us in these conversations. Um, I would love to talk to anyone about this stuff and, and at any time. Um, and uh, we really want to see you all sign um, our petition as well. Um, so I just wanted to send that invitation out and thank you all so much for listening to me. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Back to Zoom, Barbara Pearson, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. <clears throat> yes, my name, do you hear me okay? We can. Um, thank you for having the comment. My name is Barbara Pearson and I live on, at 11 Page Street in the 4th District 4. And I'm here to urge the council to take this crucial first step to make a huge benefit for our town and our planet at the same time. Please vote yes on the motion to advise the manager to issue a request for proposals to local haulers on the composting question. In my experience, the waste reduction bylaw proposal under consideration is a twofer. You have one solution that addresses two problems. So the current proposal will provide more services at lower cost, we hope, and importantly, it reduces our waste dramatically and makes a good portion of our waste even useful uh, instead of being a problem. My family decided not to go with the out-of-state company. Are you still there, Barbara? Oh, you're not here. You not hear me? It says yes, Barbara. but we're getting a lot of static. Oh, really? I'm. Please go ahead. My family decided not to go with the out-of-state company when we all lost our local haulers a few years ago. Instead, we contracted with a small business, small local business, that picks up our bucket of compost twice a month at a fraction of the cost of what the new vendor was going to charge. The buckets compact themselves while waiting for the pickup, so we're getting, we're getting rid of more than just the two buckets worth. Meanwhile, we're amazed at how much just taking those two buckets of organic recyclable material out of our household trash reduce the amount in our garbage can in general. We can now get, we now get the town trash bags and bring a full one to the transfer station just a little more often than once a month. An added perk is that my compost company brings me an equivalent amount of new compost once a year to enrich my garden and all the money stays local. So my family is very grateful to the, the council sponsors, the Board of Health, the Energy and Climate Action Committee, and the many town-wide groups that have supported this proposal. Together, they've gotten it this far. Please continue moving it forward. Let us get to the starting line in this competitive with competitive bidding so we can get to the finish line all the sooner. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for joining us, Barbara. Uh, please, the next person. Aiden Khalil. Hello. I think you just turned the mic off. Oh. Hello. There you oh. go. Speak into it. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so my name is Aiden Khalil. Um, I'm also a graduate student at UMass Amherst. Um, and I'm also a member of the Graduate Employee Organization, which is a union um, that represents about 2,700 graduate students uh, at UMass. Um, the reason I'm here, uh, following up Terrell from earlier, uh, I wanted to provide some of the, uh, the data uh, behind sort of our cost of living campaign that we're, that we're running. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm here to provide some, some data um, uh, to sort of support our cost of living campaign that we've been running as graduate students. Um, so as we as we know, um, Amherst is one of the, and I I, I uh, spoke to a counselor about this over email a few a few days ago. Um, Amherst is one of the smallest communities to host a large um, public state school. Um, a lot of the public state schools that UMass considers its peers um, are actually in 
larger, more sort of metropolitan urban areas like um, Rutgers University is in, in, in New Jersey, North Jersey, um, which has sort of the, the infrastructure to support an increase in students. Um, but uh, UMass is in the middle of Amherst. And so um, when I, uh, one of the data points I wanted to collect um, uh, was basically how quickly have we been building housing and how quickly have we been increased, have UMass been increasing enrollment? Uh, it turns out UMass is increasing its enrollment um, three and a half times faster than um, we're constructing housing units um, or rentable housing units, I should say. Um, and nobody else is even close. Uh, the closest is, I believe, at CU Boulder, I have at one, roughly 1.1 times. Um, and this has resulted in rent prices sort of exploding in the past um, several years. Uh, to put this in perspective, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, releases what they call the fair market rent um, for uh, any sort of, sort of area, metropolitan area. Uh, and for this area, for a one bedroom, it's about $1,100 a month. Um, UMass's solution to the housing issue was to construct Fieldstone, um, where a one bedroom costs about $2,085 a month, um, which is not only about double the fair market rent, it is also over 100% of what I make in a month um, on the minimum graduate student stipend. Um, and so um, to, to further the sort of talk of us um, struggling for a cost of living uh, adjustment, uh, well, UMass we have pays 30 us... seconds, please okay, wrap up. I'm sorry. Uh, UMass pays us um, below what the Department of Housing and Urban Development considers extreme low income, which in the state of Massachusetts is about $28,000. We make about 24 and a half. Um, or 20, 25. Um, and so I'm just here to, um, to ask the council if, um, you know, for your support on our petition for a, a living wage. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll go back to Zoom. Uh, John Height, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Make sure you unmute. Yes, hi, uh, um, Madam Chair, and through you to the members of the council. My name is John Height, I live in District 2. I'd like to comment briefly on the proposed waste hauler bylaw changes. Um, I've asked some of my friends recently about uh, their knowledge of the bylaw and their knowledge of the subject. And I can uh, report that unanimously, they're somewhat confused by the process, by what the bylaw will do, and by where it stands in the community. Um, although these changes have been around for, for several years, few people understand the parameters of the, the proposed policy. I certainly don't and have a lot of questions. Um, the, I'm, I'm urging that you not do anything that you are unable to extricate yourself from. I also hope that you will hire a uh, consultant who will be able to um, work on community engagement. What do people need to know? How do the how are their questions answered um, before we go about this um, very important um, and laudable goal of reducing the amount of uh, solid waste uh, and reducing methane as a result through composting? Um, the only um, the only uh, uh, answers to the questions that I seem to be from the people who are proposing the bylaw itself, their um, their guidelines and and their solutions um, are are a, a state a series of a statement of claims which seem to be to be unverified um, and um, quite um, hopeful at best. Um, the previous speaker who indicated that um, this would provide more services at a lower cost, we hope. Um, well, um, as a taxpayer, um, I'm hoping that we can get a little more information than we hope. And so I urge you to do what you can to try to allow the town manager to um, hire a consultant to um, get some answers to questions on what the real costs and real parameters of the proposal would be. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for joining us, John. We'll move back to the audience. 
Mark Murdy, please come on up. Hello, thank you so much for providing us with this time to speak. My name is Mark Murdy. I'm a student at UMass Amherst. I'm also in the graduate employee organization and I'm a member of our steering committee. For context, we created a petition that asked for housing security in our bargaining negotiations, which asked for a living wage in accordance with both the MIT living wage calculator and with recommendations for graduate workers from the Office of Science and the Department of Energy. We presented this petition to parents, students, and community members at UMass on August 28th. We collected about 860 signatures, and then the next day I had the opportunity to personally deliver this petition to the chancellor, Chancellor Javier Reyes. And he and I were able to have a brief conversation, and he mentioned that he could not bargain with me directly or with Gio, and that we'd have to go through our the university bargaining team and that any big financial decisions would have to be approved by the Board of Trustees and by the UMass president. To which I replied that I think he and I had a shared goal of making the UMass revolutionary as our motto goes, and that our pay as graduate workers right now is substandard when compared to our peer institutions. And I told him that we in GEO would be more than happy to go support our demands in front of the Board of Trustees and to the UMass president. That was the only point in the conversation where he became uncomfortable and said, we shouldn't do that because it would make things complicated, which to me was a signal that we should totally do that. I invite you all to go and sign our petition, show support for our contract campaign for a living wage. And I hope that this could be a first step towards building a coalition to demand more responsible housing policy from UMass Amherst. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, John, you have a name up there as John. Please enter the room, state your full name and where you live. And unmute, please. My name thank is you. John Root. And uh, thank you for providing the opportunity to speak. I'm a member of Zero Waste Amherst, former chair of the Re Recycling and Refuse Management Committee. Uh, almost, uh, almost eight years ago, our committee submitted a solid waste master plan to the select board outlining measures for limiting and responsibly managing waste in our town. The plan called for diversion of organics from the waste stream and incentivizing waste reduction with a pay-as-you-throw pricing system. These measures had solid support as demonstrated in our community survey prior to submitting the plan. And a recent survey has confirmed the popularity of both recycling of organics and a pay-as-you-throw. Council members don't need to be reminded how important it is to address climate issues in every way available to us and that unnecessary waste is a huge driver of climate change. It is simply unacceptable to continue to discard organics, which currently constitute about half of our garbage into our waste stream. Instead of burning or burying food waste and other organic matter, leading to yet more deadly pollution and carbon emissions, we can and should be diverting these materials to become compost for farmers and gardeners to grow our food. Communities all over the world are taking these important steps. It's the way of the future. Never does a community decide to divert organics and then change its mind, returning to dumping these valuable materials in the garbage. Many municipalities here in Massachusetts have already instituted pay-as-you-throw pricing systems. These towns and cities have typically seen 30 to 40% decreases in their amount of waste immediately after instituting pay-as-you-throw. Again, no community that has taken this measure reverts to a system that fails to incentivize waste reduction. A lot of people have worked long and hard on this proposal. Let's honor the work that's been done and get the information that we need for the council to proceed with its deliberations on the Haller proposal. If we fail to take this step, we'll never know what is possible. I would like to thank council sponsors and others who have helped to get the zero waste Amherst Haller proposal this far. Also thanks to the Board of Health, Energy and Climate Action Committee, and the many townwide civic groups for your support. And I would like to thank council members in advance for voting yes on the motion to advise the manager to issue an RFP local haulers to local haulers as a next step in the process to learn what these haulers can offer our town. Thank you for joining us, John. Back to the audience in the room. Seth Bibido. Hello, 
My name is Seth Thibodeau. I am a resident of Sunderland, Massachusetts, but I am also a graduate student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'm here tonight with several of my friends and colleagues to talk about an issue that is affecting not only me, but the greater Amherst area. Um, when I moved to Massachusetts in 2018 to start my PhD, I moved here and lived and moved to Sunderland where I paid $1,099 a month for a 475 square foot one bedroom apartment. I do not say, um, defend that this was the most frugal decision I could have made, but it was a choice that I had at the time. I was able to afford both my basic necessities and also be able to build up a small amount of savings because of the cost of living in the area being manageable at this time. Around the COVID-19 pandemic was when things started to change far for the worse. My rent began to rocket upwards, requiring me to slowly begin dipping into those savings I had stored up for the previous two years uh, until eventually they were all gone. At that point, I had to turn to small loans from my bank just to afford to be able to live in this area and to go on government assistance programs uh, to buy food and other um, necessities. When I finally moved out of that apartment last year to move in with a roommate because I simply could not afford to live there anymore, I looked at it when it went back on the market to see that that 475 square foot one bedroom apartment was on the market for $1,650 a month. This is an issue that not only affects me, the graduate students of the university, it affects the greater Amherst area and in a way that is existential as the ability for people to live in this area is critical to, this, to, the, to the Amherst. The population of this area is dominated by the university, which, which consists of about 23,000 undergraduate students and 6,500 graduate students. Of these, the university will only house 15,000. The remaining 14,000 are forced out into the area to find housing, driving up the demand and costs in the area. These 14,000 comprise of 10% of the entire population of Hampshire County, just a completely unfathomable amount that is required to find housing elsewhere. The university itself is doing nothing to alleviate this issue. In fact, they're taking steps which are making it actively worse. The construction of Fieldstone apartments, which they have allowed for a private uh, investor to set the prices of, set an air, has decided that the cost of living in the area should consist of one bedroom apartments being worth over $2,000 a month. The university has gone on record saying that this is an affordable option. It has become clear to me and my fellow graduates soon as that not only will the university do nothing, but they uh, will force finish up. The, they will force this issue on Amherst. I believe that the university has an obligation to uh, make sure that housing is affordable in this area and it is their duty. And I wish for the council to uh, sign our petition in support. Thank you for joining us. Back to Zoom. That's just so you know, that's what you hear when your time is up. <laughs> just <laughs> I, up until now, we haven't heard it. Um, Maria Kapecki, please, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you, Maria Kapicki, South Amherst, and I really do not want to hear that music again. Um, I want to talk about two issues. One is please vote in favor of the Hauler RFP. We need the information. This is a no-brainer. It would be unpardonable if the town council stopped this at this point. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the library building project. Um, the Finance Committee just had an extraordinarily disappointing meeting last week when it failed to really learn anything or get any information or talk about what's going on with the finances. Once again, we do not have any information about where the $900,000 that is still owed to the town since the end of January is. No explanation. The town has apparently not tried to go get this money. The historic tax credits, the $1.8 million that were rejected twice, uh, we still have not gotten an explanation of why that was not shared with this body, which deliberated and voted in the fall, and then deliberated and voted again on uh, matters that, that that was germane to in, in the spring. Who knew about this aside from the library director? Did anybody on the town council know about this? Did anybody on the library trustees? And why was that not shared publicly and with these other bodies? In the meantime, the quote value engineering 
uh, that was proposed at 2.9 million has been since cut in half. And if you, uh, so if you take that 1.5 million that they're trying to cut and you add to that the million dollars in uh, cost escalation and the $500,000 that's gonna be paid to do this value engineering, you have essentially a wash. We, that the, there is no reason to expect a bid to come in any less than $7 million over. In addition, rather than the whole, one of the arguments of going back yeah. out to bid was that there was gonna be all this other, all this interest that's gonna happen to rebid it in six months. Well, there's not. There's actually fewer general contractors who were pre-qualified than when this happened six months ago. So the town council has a fiscal responsibility here. You need to talk about this. You need to intervene. Please, please do your job for fiscal responsibility. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll go back to the room. Vince O'Connor. Is the three minute clock available? It's right up on the screen. Um, it's, yeah. it's very small. You can see it in the Way town room the window. Where? where? Um, it's not visible. Right here. here. I'll okay. let you know. So um, if somebody could maybe raise their hand every minute so I can schedule my comments. I have three issues I'm going to speak to you. One about is the green energy project. The other is about trash and composting. The other is about the reparations committee. First, on the energy project, I think the crucial issue um, for me as a resident of Amherst is whether this organization whose governance structure has not been, was not in the literature I received, um, my concern would be that this organization can turn into a project that would greenwash environmentally destructive corporate activities, such as the project on Shootsbury, the solar project on Shootsbury. Two minutes. Um, and that's that's my concern, and I hope the, the council will take that into consideration. The second is trash and composting. Um, and Speaking as one of the organizers of the Amherst Area Tenants Association local, Mill Hollow local, mm -hmm. I want to say that um, to have a composting pro project that does not have any, even any um, efforts in the tenant community, I think would be wrong. So I think at least three, a small, medium sized and large apartment complex needs to be included in this, no matter what the landlords say, because 50% of the housing units in this town are in apartments. Third. Um, with, One minute. Yeah. Um, with regard to the reparations committee, I'll propose the solution. This committee should be a committee of the council, headed by a member of the council, as a way of having the council control the appointments. Because it is clear to me that the town manager should not be involved in these appointments. He has a terrible problem with black women, given his failed committee that he attempted to put in place before the new superintendent of schools came in, um, his, his problems with reappointing Ms. Ferreira, and, and his inability to see to it that his employers, employees carry out the projects um, that have, have to do with CREF. Five seconds. Um, with, with CREF, and um, with the uh, project and, um, and, Thank other, you, and other issues that were under his responsibility. He should not be making the appointments to this Vince, committee. This should be a thank committee you. of the council. Thank you. We'll go back to the uh, to Zoom. Darcy Dumont, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. 
Okay. Uh, hi, counselors. Uh, my name is Darcy Dumont and I live in District 3. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. First, um, I want to express my excitement at the launch of Valley Green Energy. Um, I was one of the founding community members of the multi-town task force, um, and I'm a board member of Local Energy Advocates. I'm really proud that we now have a joint aggregation with the potential of being a leader in providing locally sourced and greener energy at competitive prices. I'm gonna be purchasing the 100% renewable option and I hope some of you do too. And for those of you who have suppliers other than Eversource, I hope you will consider opting into Valley Green Energy. Um, it's another opportunity in Amherst to buy local. Uh, I'm speaking today on behalf of Zero Waste Amherst, the community sponsor of the Waste Hauler Bylaw Amendment referred uh, to TSO in August of 2022. Uh, we thank the TSO and the counselor sponsors for their attention to the bylaw and for recommending that the manager take the steps necessary to get hard cost information about the potential elements of the proposal. Um, uh, we have needed that for a while now, and I thank the members for pushing the proposal forward. CWA asks that you all vote yes on the motion coming up at today's meeting. We're a town committed to waste reduction. Those residents want it, whose residents want to do the right thing. We have a wide support for this proposal and a lot of related survey data and public comments from both a survey of the town in 2023 and a survey in 2017 when the town was presented a solid waste master plan, as John Root mentioned. CWA is glad to help out with more outreach as we move along. Thanks for your expected support of the motion to advise the manager to issue an RFP to local haulers and to ascertain cost information with regard to the waste hauler bylaw proposal. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us, Darcy. We'll go back to the room. Is there anybody left? No. Uh, Madeline Charney, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. You will be the last commenter. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. My name's Madeline Charney. I live on Cherry Lane in District 2. I'm a leader in Mothers Out Front Amherst and a board member of Common Share Food Co-op coming to our town. <laughs> Both organizations have endorsed the elements of the original proposal, Universal Curbside Compost Pickup Bylaw, along with many other groups in Amherst. The methane produced by food waste is a top cause of climate change through the release of methane from landfills, emissions from waste to energy, trash combustors, and the transportation of waste to disposal or recycling facilities. Uh, at least 40% of our trash is food scraps, and I once was uh, given this visual by an expert that every day in this country we fill the size of the Rose Bowl Stadium with food waste, which I found like stomach turning. We could do better in our town. Um, so the landfills and incinerators where our waste goes are also a major source of land, air, and water pollution, which particularly affect environmental justice communities. Mothers Out Front, Amherst, and the Common Share Food Co-op take these threats very seriously. In addition, using a pay-as-you-throw fee structure has been shown to cause a further dramatic reduction of trash, and Darcy has all the data on that that she referred to. As you may know, Massachusetts is in a crisis over waste disposal, facing a severe disposal capacity shortage. The Massachusetts DEP has a goal of zero waste, but it's not keeping up with this goal. So every little bit we do, can do will help. Finally, as the mother of a teenager, I feel this addition of townwide compost pickup shows my kid and other local youth that our town cares about the environment. It's not just their hippie parents managing our endless household scraps. And so we urge the council to eventually adopt 
a robust version of the bylaw proposal. But tonight, the council, you don't need to decide whether to adopt the proposal. We're just asking to advise the manager to pursue getting cost information that would then guide the decision making of the council. We urge you and I urge you to move this very important proposal forward by voting yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. That concludes public comment. Uh, we will uh, now move to the consent agenda. Um, the following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent for agenda for discussion later in the meeting, please make sure I know that after I read the original motion one time. Um, the request to remove an item does not require a second. To move the following items in the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, adoption of resolution in support of completing the Mass Central Rail Trail. 9A, 1 and 2, approval of Town Manager Appointments Energy and Climate Action Committee, Council on Aging. 11A and to C, approval of the following meeting minutes, April 8, 2024, regular meeting, April 29, 2024, special meeting, August 19, 2024, regular meeting. Are there any items people would like moved? I'm seeing no hands, I'm seeking a second. Second, Rooney. Thank you. I will begin the vote then with Anna. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner is absent. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. I'm sorry, Councillor Walker. Ah, yes, she did tell me that she was going to have to duck out for part of the meeting. And Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Thank you. That passes unanimously with 11 counselors in favor and two absent. Um, I would like now to ask Jennifer Taub, one of the sponsors of the resolution, to read the last two paragraphs. Um, now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Amherst Town Council, recognizes and stands by more than two decades of planning by our elected and appointed officials and affirms that completion of the Mass Central Rail tra Trail is consistent with a safer, greener, and more welcoming community, and that the completion of the rail trail aligns seamlessly with our town's vision for a thriving, interconnected community creating an environmentally sound and sustainable multi-purpose legacy for future generations. And be it further resolved that the clerk of the Amherst Town Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to Governor Maura Healey, State Representative Mindy Dom, and State Senator Joe Comerford, to the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, and the Office of Outdoor Recreation to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and to local media. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on then to action items and we'll begin with the bylaw 3.33 refuse collection and recyclable materials waste hauler program and begin with the town services and out outreach committee and so, Andy, you're chair of that, but I understand George will be making a presentation. So how would you like to proceed? Um, I was. I will ask uh, Vice Chair Ryan to uh, make the presentation. Thank you. So there's some slides up on the screen that will go along with the presentation. It takes about eight minutes. TSO this evening um, is asking the council to consider making a number of important changes to the way the town of Amherst deals with waste. Slide. Beginning with its 2012 food-related styrofoam ban and its 2016 plastic bag ban, 
and I should include the 2015 Solid Waste Master Plan, Amherst has proved to be a regional leader in environmentally conscious waste management practices. Many Massachusetts communities are now focusing on waste disposal as part of their overall response to climate change. Materials management is also climate action. TSO believes it is time for Amherst to revise its waste management practices. At the heart of our proposal are three elements. Slide. That the town move to a town contracted system, that the system incorporate a robust pay as you throw fee structure, and that the new system include curbside compost collection. We acknowledge that what we are proposing will initially require the expenditure of town funds, and if enacted, it will require a change in behavior for some, if not many, town residents. If the council agrees with TSO that the town should move in this direction, we ask the council this evening to vote to request that the town manager issue a request for a proposal, which would, include, which would include the key elements mentioned above. Such a motion, if passed, would necessitate the hiring of a consultant to assist the town manager in developing an RFP. The consultant would also assist the committee in crafting a revision of the bylaw as part of the process of developing an RFP. Slide. The current system, under the current system, individuals, businesses, and institutions in town contract on their own with a private hauler to dispose of their trash and recycling. Haulers are licensed by the town's health department. USA Waste is now the primary residential curbside trash collection provider in Amherst. In addition to weekly collection of household trash, their standard service also includes bi-weekly collection of unlimited recyclables. In addition, they offer bi-weekly curbside collection of composting upon request for an additional monthly fee of $15 a month. That's $180 a year. The compost option is not substantially promoted. The cost differential between trash cart sizes provides minimal incentive to reduce waste through separation of recycling and compostables. Slide. The current system, under the current system, with the purchase of an annual permit, residents who do not wish to individually contract with a waste hauler can dispose of trash and recycling at the, answer, at the Amherst transfer station. Household trash is collected through a pay-as-you-throw program using prepaid trash bags, and food waste compost collection is offered free of charge. The transfer station also accept, accepts, accepts electronics, many bulk, bulky waste items, batteries, mercury items, scrap metal, and yard waste. And some of these items have disposal fees. The Department of Public Works provides as well an annual townwide curbside leaf collection, and in addition, an annual household hazardous waste collection event, which is open to all residents, not just permit holders. Slide. So what we're proposing is that first, the town would negotiate and contract with a waste hauler on behalf of the residents. In addition to regular trash collection, the hauler would be required to provide collection of unlimited recyclables and compostables. The contract would include a robust pay-as-you-throw system to incentivize residents to reduce waste going to landfills by recycling and composting. Curbside composting would be made available to all residents. How that will be best accomplished has yet to be determined. The transfer station would remain open, but the exact role it will play in the waste management program has yet to be determined. The program would be phased in beginning with single family and two to four unit residences, and then over three years expanding to all other residential properties. Haulers would be required to provide an annual report de detailing the weight in tons of trash, recyclables, and compostables collected within the town of Amherst. And an advantage in awarding a contract would be given to those haulers who would dispose of compost locally. Slide. So why change the system? Well, I think the short answer is that we can and we must do better. If we are serious about our climate goals, we need to improve our waste management practices. According to the latest figures from MassDEP, organics comprise 30% by weight of what goes into our landfills. Diverting 30% of our waste stream will significantly reduce our reliance on landfills and incinerators. In eliminating compostables, especially food waste from trash, will reduce greenhouse gas emissions which are a byproduct of organics in landfills and will also help meet one of the town's stated climate action goals. 
Processing compost locally will also reduce transportation related emissions. Mass DEP reports that around 35% of the state's solid waste is now disposed of out of state and that by the end of the decade, only one landfill will be operating in state. Improving our waste management practices will help reduce hauling and disposal costs as well as reducing our carbon footprint. The current pricing and service options for trash disposal are not clear. A town contracted service would improve transparency and public control over waste practices in town. And finally, a pay-as-you-throw fee structure is considered a best practice in reducing trash. It incentivizes people to recycle and to compost their organics. The current system does not do that. Next slide. A number of questions, however, remain that TSO has been unable to answer, which we, we believe can best be resolved through a carefully crafted RFP. A consultant can help us decide what should be included in an RFP and then can proceed to draft that RFP. Some, though not all of the issues, include things like how will enforcement be handled, who will handle complaints and customer service, what additional services will be available, such as bulk pickup um, and yard waste, Will there be exemptions? And if so, what would they be? How would the pay as you throw fee structure be uh, arranged? How do we best do outreach to the community to inform them of what we are considering and to get their input? How do we best phase in larger residential complexes, including condominiums and homeowners associations? How best to make curbside composting available to all residents and residences? Should the bylaw include small businesses? What will be the role of the transfer station? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, what will be the cost to the consumer and to the town? We need help to get answers to these questions. If this proceeds, TSO will be reporting back to the council on a regular basis throughout the process. The council will have the final say on what goes into the bylaw. TSO will also be looking to initiate a robust process of community outreach, both to share with residents what is being planned and to seek their input. And to do that, we will obviously need your support and participation. What we need this evening is your agreement that we are headed in the right direction and your support in seeking the help we need to bring our waste management practices into line with our commitment to climate action and climate justice. Slide. Thank you, George. Um, is there anybody else from TSO who would like to make a comment before we open it for questions? Okay, seeing none, the floor is open for questions and comments. Mandy Jow, I'm sorry, Councillor Haneke. Um. One of my questions that was not answered and it seemed like TSO did not pursue in uh, its discussions before it brought this proposal to us is what is the rough cost of the consultant? It in its information just said, we don't know. Uh, I don't, I know we might not know really good what it might be, um, but are we looking at 5,000, 50,000, 100,000? I would like to know a rough estimate before we vote. Um, TSO in that report, that presentation, thank you, George, Councilor Ryan for that. Um, one of its slides talked about what is being proposed, but then it talked about the advantages, why change, and part of it is about serious about climate action goals to improve waste management practices, um, to significantly reduce reliance on landfills and incinerators. Um, but the proposal is to start with one, two, three, and four unit properties and never put businesses in, yet the emphasis is on food waste in, um, in the waste system. So I'd like some response to that to me seems um, that we're leaving the most impactful, impactful um, people or properties to last instead of first or leaving them out completely. Um, <clears throat> apartment complexes don't have a place. Individual residents don't always have a place to compost. 
single family homes might compost already on their property. Why are we not looking at starting at um, apartment complexes and the places that might not, that might affect the most people that don't have an option to really compost right now? Um, what would this proposal do for residences that are also businesses? <clears throat> um, how would it affect a, um, you know, a mixed use building in downtown that has residences and businesses? How would it affect Amherst College? How would it affect Hampshire College? That's not clear with um, page, you know, the what is being proposed. And then again, it talks about a lot of climate doing the right thing. I noticed on the um, why change the current system, the cost wasn't mentioned. I've believed from the beginning, if we really want to do the right thing, we need to just change the bylaw. Um, because if we believe compost should be pulled out of the waste stream, we should change the bylaw to require compost to be pulled out of the waste stream um, and recognize that that might cost more because sometimes doing the right thing for climate costs more. So I'd like an idea from other counselors is does changing this system and your willingness to change this system really depend on what the cost estimates come back in and if it might be more expensive than the current system to anyone, the transfer station users or the non-transfer station users, whether we have the, the um, desire and necessary ability and stamina to still make that change? Or are we going to, if we get a cost that is more than the transfer station number, that but would require us to close the transfer station to users that do it, or that is more than the number that people are paying, single family homes using curbside compost are paying now, it's more than that, are we going to be willing to still do it? I'm going to continue on with questions and then we have a period for PF people from TSO to respond. Uh, point of order, can we just confirm that Councillor Walker can hear us? I'm sorry, yes. Councillor Walker, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, Kathy Shane, please go ahead. Um, I echo some of what Mandy just listed as concerns. And one of it is, it's not clear to me why we're starting with the households that we're starting rather than the bigger users and businesses. And um, that leads me to my first general question is, um, will we or and or the consultant see a draft of the new bylaw that seems to me that the consultant, that decision is fairly important um, and if it's in or if it's in as an option, the bidders are going to be looking at the volume of what they're picking up. And if the volume is bigger, the price tag might be better on a per unit basis. Um, so the other place in Mandy's fairly long list of places that consume and probably generate food waste are our schools. Um, Amherst College's dorms, uh, Amherst College's Valentine Hall. Um, we we heard from DPW that it was one of the um, sources of gunk in our system that was backing up our sewers. The amount of stuff. So it um, we've got some food users, but I just I think whatever is in the draft, maybe we're going to change it later. That to draft an RFP, you have to know what we're asking for. And so some of these decisions seem to have been made, but I'm not sure they're as it whether be in an option A, a B, or C in it. Um, um, are there model towns that we're looking at? Um, and if there are some model towns that we're looking at, directing the consultant to them would save them time on drafting an RFP because they started from somewhere. Um, and so seeing how they worded the RFP, what what pieces they did. And then my last question is um, the loop that comes back to us. Um, let's assume we move uh, forward on this with our motion for the town manager. Before we go out, um, 
to actually bid, will we see the RFP? So it will help answer some of my questions of what are we asking somebody to bid on if I know what elements are in the RFP? And so some assurance, and the we might not be the whole council, might be just TSO, that we double check, that we haven't just turned it over to a consultant and a town manager. Um, and I have asked in the past, um, Mandy listed what is, what's the cost level that, that causes pain or causes joy one way or the other, you know, yay, it's lower or, oh my gosh, it's not. Um, Guilford is on the line here. I see him. And, you know, there is, to, it, it, when you contract for services, someone is doing the contracting and that is town and town staff. So there's a town staff element to all of that, that I still don't have a clear sense of that. You know, are we talking about adding one or two people? into DPW to manage a contracted trash pickup where right now all these all of us households try to figure out what we're doing. Um, and and so so we just need a rough estimate of that um, and what does it cost to manage it. In the terrific document we got from MMA, they talked about some of the towns as examples um, that didn't completely understand what they were getting into and had to go back and rewrite right things. And some of it was the level of burden on the town staff on who gets complaints, who resolves complaints, you know, who negotiates the prices, how often are the prices negotiated? Is it, do we get a two year pricing on trash pickup from the bidders in return for giving them amorous? So all of this is part of the RFP. You know, if I think I'm writing the RFP, I need some instructions on what I'm asking people to bid on. And then later, it's going to come back into how much do we think this is high on people's list? And when we do the administrative overhead of town staff, what does it do to pricing? And I know we can't answer that now, but I just don't want to lose sight of that because it's a real cost um, to, to think of staffing this um, as we go down the road. That's it. Thank you. Pam Bruni. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the questions and comments that have been made by the two, two folks preceding me. Um, but I also am looking at the timeline and I appreciate the fact that there is a fair amount of time to um, adjust and negotiate, uh, especially with the consultant to try to handle and get, and get some answers to those questions before we have to proceed. So I do support moving forward with a with a um, request for proposal. I think I think it's a logical next step. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go to TSO, I'm going to step out of my role and exercise my uh, role as a counselor, um, which I am. Uh, first of all, TSO has worked hard on this, and as have many many people in this community who have been on our committees, both inside town government and outside of town government. And it is people who believe very strongly in how, what are the many, many ways we can help our environment. Um, this is a big job and it's a big change. Um, it will require a number of things, including a lot of citizen education. For a couple of reasons, I spent some time over the last, ever since the timeline became available to actually relook at the timeline. And I relooked re at it with a couple of things in mind. The people who have raised other questions, I thank you for that. My timeline would scare you because it would actually include a consultant that's gonna do more than just develop an RFP and maybe a bylaw. No committee of a council where all of us have other things in our lives besides our council job, has the time to do all of the things that need to happen to do this kind of change in government. In addition to that, outreach was put at the end of the process, by which time most of the bylaw will be cooked. It should be at the beginning of the process. And in order to do that, we should be able to say, as we began saying tonight, these are the key elements. And so one of the roles of a consultant would be to identify the key elements and a process by which 
we go out to the broad community and get their feedback. And then finally, uh, at no place in the timeline did I see the Board of Health mentioned, and they in fact promulgate the regulations for the town of Amherst when it comes to waste hauling. So um, I have uh, taken the opportunity to discuss this with both the chair of TSO and uh, the vice chair, and uh, they're perfectly aware that I'm more than willing to share this, you know, proposed revised timeline, but frankly, it's detail that we're not gonna do tonight. Uh, I totally support moving forward. I just wanna make sure that we move forward in a way that we hear from our residents early, we define the program early, and we get feedback and answer all of the questions before we write a bylaw and we go out and say, how much will you charge us to provide this service? Uh, many of the questions that were put up on the screen are not questions that someone answering an RFP will for uh, services uh, will be able to provide for composting trash, et cetera, will be able to provide. They're questions we need to come up with answers about. So I, um, with that, I, I'm just going to pause. I'm going to recognize Andy and take my hand down. Okay, thank you, and I want to thank everybody for their questions. I'll do the best I can as efficiently as I can. Uh, instead, of just in the order the questions were asked, pretty much. The question of the cost of the consultant, I actually have to get back to the last comment, too, uh, from Council Councilor Greensburg. Uh, the cost of consultant will obviously depend in part upon what we ask the consultant to do. And um, the topic that we uh, need to talk with the town manager further about as far as what his estimate is. Um, and uh, he, uh, it is my understanding that uh, before any money is allocated for the purpose that his intention is to come back to the council and to share that information because uh, he's going to uh, need council approval for um, the annual free cash transfer that happens every year. And at that point in time, uh, he will need to provide that information to us. So we would be asking him to begin the process of putting together the RFP um, actually, the RFP that precedes the RFP because he's, he's first going to have to look for a consultant and what the work plan for the consultant will be. That's really um, the only thing that would happen with the yes vote in the um, request tonight. Um, anything else will come back to the council for further action, including um, the actual um, uh, money approval and that goes with an explanation that um, hopefully will answer some of the questions. And by the way, I do know that while um, Town Manager Bachelman is not with us tonight, that Assistant Town Manager Zomak is here as well as uh, the uh, Superintendent of Public Works uh, Mooring and either one of them might be adding um, to what is otherwise being presented. Um, the question as to why we are starting with, uh, are suggesting to start with uh, residences is that the um, there are two parts to um, our system when it comes down to it. Everything is done um, as uh, Councilor Ryan indicated by either contract with a hauler or um, the transfer station, the contract with the hauler, by far the, the most complex contract arrangement that covers the largest number of properties is the one that serves residences that can be picked up by curbside pickup. And um, the um, decision to start with that group um, partly is because 
well, it's a lot of properties and it's the smallest properties. It's it's the one that is covers a lot of the town with a single concept of service. And um, the other things that were mentioned are also very important apartment complexes, other kinds of residences that don't um, have uh, curbside pickup uh, businesses, um, the college, other other providers, um, other users of services. Um, those are all important parts of the service, but they're multiple um, providers that get involved there. And uh, it was a uh, um, question of try where do you start? Because to do it all at one time is one thing that we were warned about very much is to not try and do everything at once, but to try and do it sequentially so that we do it right as we do each step to it. Um, so that was the thinking behind that. Um, as far as uh, the question of the bylaw, I you know I'm, I sort of go back and forth as to whether we're, we're really looking for initially as a bylaw, or are we looking for uh, something that is really what Council President called key elements? What is it that we're looking for uh, the, the system to do? that we need to have information on in an RFP. And uh, that initial timeline we put together is going to be need to be modified as we learn more and find out more about the complexity of the process. Um, but in there, uh, before an RFP was, ever, was to be issued, even in the first of, in rendition of that uh, waste hauler work plan is uh, that we would uh, be reaching back to the council and saying, this is what we think it, it would look like and um, make sure that the council is fully involved in the discussion at that stage and before it goes out to um, a, the actual request for proposals and get to that to the uh, consultant that would be hired to help um, at the beginning of the process. So um, that um, regardless of whether we want to call it um, a bylaw or just uh, want to call it the key elements or the factors that we're looking for in a um, our, in, in the proposals that would go into the RFP, that is uh, something that I think we're very committed to doing in an open process, which gets into a question that was raised about the um, outreach. And uh, we looked at initially at the question of outreach being when we had sufficient information from the results of the RFP that there would be um, information that we could share as we um, reached out to the community to explain um, what we're doing. I think the one thing that we probably learned from uh, comments that we've received even of in, in the last week is that um, there is a benefit to starting the outreach earlier and doing the outreach multiple times uh, that we do the, at a, uh, we, we do the outreach multiple times so that is what we would be um, planning to do so I think that uh, uh, regardless of what happens um, tonight, um, assuming, uh, you know, and I hope it is to an indication that, yes, the ultimate goals are worth pursuing and let's pursue them. Uh, the next thing we need to do is get back to TSO and um, spend more time with what we've learned in the comments this evening and uh, proceed with, to work with the town manager and uh, whatever staff that he designates so we should work with to try and put together the answers to the questions that you've posed tonight, uh, both to get them back to the council and to begin to use it as a way of um, moving forward to getting to the next stage in the process, which is to get the information that is necessary to find out what it's gonna take to get this uh, 
program moving. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Jennifer, you are also on TSO and also one of the sponsors. And I want to recognize that Alicia Walker was one of the original sponsors of this as well. So mm -hmm. Jennifer- As was Andy. As was Andy, right. right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Jennifer, please proceed. Uh, thank you. So I also want to thank George for the uh, excellent presentation. And I just want to add a couple of things. Andy uh, covered many of the you know questions that were that were asked. But I, in terms of the restaurants and the university, um, that is something we may want to further address. But there's something in Massachusetts called the commercial food material disposal, the commercial food material disposal ban. And that is already in place and applies to businesses, which would include restaurants, schools, and other institutions. So because those entities produce so much waste, that's something that is also um, regulated at, at the state level. So it's not something that we're just, that's being ignored. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of staff, the time um, that will, you know, will we have to add staff? Will, how much of a burden it will be on our, on staff to oversee the program? There will certainly be staff time involved, but part of what we can ask for in an RFP is for the um, potential vendors to include a cost for the vendor to handle customer service and even calls from residents to handle the billing. So that's all part of the service that we can contract out. You know, again, of course, there'll be staff um, a liaison to the vendor, um, but we can contract more or less of the, the how the service is administered to the vendor um, as well. So those were the uh, 2.0. Oh, and in terms of whether we will, I guess, in response to the question, is this, are we so committed to waste reduction that we would even impose a higher cost on the community? I mean, that's something we absolutely cannot decide now. We, we have to see um, what information we get from the RFP, and that's a conversation um, further down the line. Okay. George. So TSO is committed to keeping this body in the loop every step of the way, but we need help to move forward. Um, we will certainly begin outreach as soon as we possibly can. What I'm looking for tonight is a sense that you all think we're headed in the right direction. And so I'm back to that slide, what is being proposed? There were eight items lift, listed on that slide and the one concern, none of the others raised any concern that I recall, except item six, which had to do with the phasing in and uh, the fact that we're starting with residences rather than with larger uh, residential units. And Councillor Steinberg answered that. I, it's, it, it, we've been advised over and over again, don't bite off more than you can chew and start with something that has the best chance of success. And he's also pointed out, it's also the largest actual number. Uh, so. Um, it seems to me, unless I'm not hearing it, that you all like uh, at least seven, if not eight of those core uh, elements of what we are working on. So um, what we're asking you tonight is that what we're saying to you is we cannot proceed without help. So uh, we need your help. And that means we need an RP and we need uh, consulting. Thank you. Uh, Guilford. Um... Superintendent of Public Works, Gilford Morin, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think everyone has kind of covered most of the questions that were asked, except for what the price range is we're expecting for this consultant to be. And we're we're thinking it's in the fifty to one to fifty to seventy five thousand dollar range to bring a consultant on to do this. Um, it, it we would use this consultant to put the RFP together, and then to if we want to do. If, um, outreach before it goes out or is it actually do outreach after we get the numbers back? Um, there are a lot of questions that we can't answer in public outreach until we actually ask the RFP. Um, we have numbers from other communities. Um, when we did the RFI, the numbers that came in showed that the price would be lower. Um, but those numbers, some of them are older and other communities were in the process of working out new contracts. Um, so we don't have those. We definitely um, need to get those numbers before we can answer the, because most people's questions is going to be, well, how much is it going to cost me to save the world? Um, I hate to say it that way, but we all think that way. How much is it going to cost me? 
Um, so that's the biggest question people want to hear. Um, and that's what we need the RFP to do. Are we committed once we do the RFP to agree to work with someone or to enter into a contract with them? No, we're not. If we don't like the proposals, we say, no, we're going to stay with what we have. And then if we want to still go and require um, we have um, compostable collection, then we can, we can regulate it or legislate it the same way the state is doing it with the larger institutions. Um, if Amherst doesn't get around to actually um, banning compost compostables in their waste, eventually the state will get to the single family households and say, it's banned from your trash too. But they are starting with the bigger communities, UMass, Amherst College, I believe Hampshire College also has to separate their compostable food waste mm -hmm. from their trash stream now. And it will slowly work its way, according to the state plan, work its way down to bigger bigger restaurants, smaller restaurants. And the plan originally was to go to households as well. So that was their top-down approach. And that's one of the reasons why we chose a bottom-up approach is with the, single, the, smaller, the smaller households first and then go up. Um, so I think... I think that's all the question. I think every question has been answered. Um, if I missed one, I'm happy to answer some more if you remind me what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Haneke. I'll mention a few more things I have on the question of concerns regarding the slide, what is being proposed as uh, Councillor Ryan uh, asked for. Um, one of the reasons I didn't mention some of that is I was waiting for a motion on the floor, and it sounds like maybe we're not going to get a motion tonight that we might get one in a couple of weeks based on this conversation. Um, I was very concerned with the motion in the packet because it didn't outline what is being proposed. So I'll make my comment now that I hope whatever motion is putting on be, being put on the floor actually has bullet points of goals, not referring to a document as what is in the packet on the motion sheet that doesn't really exist or could be interpreted as any number of documents that have existed in the past. Um, as to the slide that uh, in was in Councilor Ryan's pro the, the presentation, that's number six titled, What is Being Proposed? Um, question on number one, uh, it says contract with a waste hauler on behalf of residents. Uh, waste hauler or haulers, would you be able, would, would this RFP potentially allow a hauler to bid on only the compost side or only the recyclable side? Um, or does the hauler have to bid on all three? Uh, given some of the things we've heard and some of the things that some TSO members have told me in conversation, it might be wise to allow a hauler to bid on just a portion of the goals. Um, the fourth item doesn't uh, made available to all residents. That sounds like you wouldn't necessarily require all residents to do so, or maybe there's a different way of wording it. I just wanted to point out that it really is available to all residents right now, um, as presented in the conversation and presentation. Um, but that one, I don't really have a problem with. It's just, I'm not quite sure what the goal of that is. Is it required for all residents or could residents choose to do it so they have to have it available, but they don't have to? Would they have to prove that they're composting on their own property if they choose not to? Things like that. A little bit more clarity as to what that goal is would be helpful. Uh, number five with the transfer station. It remaining open with a role in a waste management program that is yet to be determined leaves open the possibility that those of us, those residents who haul trash to the transfer station through the sticker program without a curbside program may or may not be enabled to do that again. And I don't know where this council stands. I don't know where I stand because I truly believe that if you remove that option for those that are using that option now, their costs will go up. I don't think you can do it for less than 125 a year, even with a townwide contract. Um, hence my question about what are we willing to incur cost-wise for our residents. Um, but for the other roles that the transfer stations plays, yard waste, many composters take yard waste. 
So it's not clear to me that it would be necessary to keep the transfer station open to provide yard waste, that any hauler we contract with might be able to provide yard waste. Many haulers also have an option to call them for bulk waste disposal pickup. So it's not clear to me that we would need to remain the transfer station open for that. So I'd like to see number five somehow reworded to make sure that the RFP could somehow allow a potential contract to include maybe separately as an add-on or however it's worded in RFPs, provision for current transfer station services instead of keeping the transfer station open. Um, I think we should ask for that information if we're aiming for this RFP to get us costs. I think we should not remove that option completely. Um, thank you for all the answers to number six. That is very helpful. Um, those are my other comments on at least the slide that says what is being proposed. Thank you. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Please speak to the mic. I wanted to talk to some of those folks, but I'll figure out a way to do it. Um, I'm sitting here and there's a lot I support about this, um, but I'm uncomfortable with a couple of things, um, many things. But my biggest concern is like the statement that we're where it's all about climate justice and it's about economic justice. Yet we're talking about a system that will be more costly for most residents. And when finally businesses, et cetera, I say that, I'll clarify that because it's obviously bothering you. Uh, when we say businesses eventually and, and rent renters, et cetera, uh, landlords and developers, et cetera, um, they're going to put the costs of this on their tenants. We know that. So um, it's not clear to me that this really addresses economic justice because people who are using the transfer station, this has already been said, are paying a whole hell of a lot less than people who are using the waste hauler services. Many of us do it. I have the ability to pay for a waste hauler, but I don't use it. I take my trash to the uh, transfer station. I recycle. I compost on my property and the things that I don't want in my personal compost, like meat, I send to the um, transfer station. And so for me, you're asking me to take on costs that luckily I can afford, but not everybody can afford. And I really see this impacting renters. We just had a bunch of people here talking about rent. And I don't see how this helps them at all. So to me, I want to know the costs, but somehow or other, I think it's there there must be some way to do this without paying fifty to seventy five thousand dollars for a consultant when we don't even know what we want. Uh, so I, I guess I'd like some pulling back a little bit and us really defining what it is we want before we spend that much money. I'd rather see it go elsewhere, I must admit. I can't believe you can't talk to a waste hauler and say, these are the things they were thinking about. What would it cost you? What would you be charging? Would you use, uh, would you expect the town to administer? There are things that can be found out so that if we do need a consultant, it's a very limited action. Um, I just don't, I don't know. And this, it, I wish I could just embrace this. I really do, but I, I, right now I can't. I'm gonna skip to um, Councillor Ette uh, because he has not spoken yet. Oh, could someone else speak? Uh, everybody else that is, the other people are TSO members. So I'd like to make sure that uh, you're also on TSO. Is that right? No. Oh. No. So, Councillor. Okay. So I think I just wanted to say that it's been mentioned a few times, but it needs to be emphasized we need to have a more robust i think 
I think we need to have a more robust public engagement with the process. We do have to do the right thing, but when there's a cost attached, different people can pay different costs. And from what I've seen, it appears like the engagement with the public is something that has taken a backseat and those who might be affected by some of these changes have not been brought in to the process and perhaps we need to think a little bit more about that. Thank you. Jennifer, I'll come back to you and then Andy. Do you want me to go to Andy first? No, I thought, oh, I didn't know if you said you were coming back to me. Okay, so you called on me. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Um, so I did want to respond a couple of things questions that Pat had brought up. So we are going into this hoping and then that we would like to keep the, I mean, the transfer station will remain open. We can say that is a requirement. We are not going to go to another. We, we are trying to get information on cost. So what will it cost to keep the transfer station functioning exactly as it is now? There is absolutely no um, intent <laughs> or to close the transfer station. We're committed to the transfer station being open. Might there be other changes in how that's used? That will be part, we will be asking for costs based on the transfer station staying open as it is now. And that'll be all part, that is why we need to get that information. Apartments now don't use the transfer station. So, so there is a, right. So I'm just saying it's not, it shouldn't, prices should, we hope, Prices will go down. Other communities that get competitively bid their waste collection, where it's a competitively bid process, and they have a pay-as-you-throw fee structure, the prices, we'll see what, what comes back, but that has been the experience of other municipalities, that the prices are less than the current service the way we use it now. And apartments are already using part of what's into their, you know, part of the rent already is for the waste collection services. So we would hope that would go down, but certainly not increase and that it would be more environmentally responsible and help us meet our climate um, action goals. So, and in terms of, we will, we can start doing outreach in the community and zero waste Amherst, our community sponsor has been doing it, you know, for a long time. Um, I know that even in the last council session, uh, the uh, councilor Pam and I invited representatives from Zero, Zero Waste Amherst to our district meetings, and that's something we can all do. And of course, we'll do more sort of systematic um, outreach. But um, we can start that now, but what is going to be asked in the community is how much is this gonna cost? And that's where we get back to where we are now is we can't answer that question, which is those are really important questions until we issue the RFP and hear back from vendors. And we can say to a vendor, you know, can you handle the billing? Can you handle customer service calls? And of course they can say yes, but we still don't have a price. And what what are the, so that's, we have, but they, that's not really how it works. <laughs> I mean, they they're not, you know, because it's a competitive process. I mean, they're going to want to submit a bid that's not public, that you can't tell another vendor. This vendor offered at this price, so they can, that. Um, and I, and in terms of the cost of the, of the consultant, I mean, we could have a, we could ask the town manager if a consultant could be retained just to help with the RFP. That would be less costly than doing community outreach. We, Think would want them to do community outreach but in terms of consultant hours the tso had talked about the consultant more so doing just the rfp we didn't want to ask the consultant to have to come to tso meetings because the town manager said that could be more costly is to first have the consultant work on the rfp so we could get that information i thought we did have a your last slide was a motion george so maybe we hadn't it hadn't been read yet. The motion's not been put on the okay, floor. But that there was going to be is you. going to be a motion tonight. Mm -hmm. Andy. Yeah, I actually uh, was going to uh, start before I do anything else and make a motion, and it is slightly different in wording, um, not substantially different, but I'm going to make the following motion: I move to advise the town manager. 
to issue a request for proposals RFP on behalf of proposed changes to general bylaw 3.33 refuse collections and recyclable materials. Second, Rooney. Okay. And um, the, the change is. Uh, I'd, I'd like the count town the clerk to, of the town council to please put that motion up on the screen. Did you get the, uh, did you figure where the um, change in the wording was? Uh, I wanted to be very careful because I think that we, well, we, we know we want to change 3.33, but um, I don't want to have any implication that the bylaw that was originally introduced by the sponsors is the motion is the changes and the changes are going to have to be identified through a process that includes the community and then ultimately the council. Um, I think that's one thing that we obviously uh, have come to in the discussion this evening. Having uh, therefore put the motion on, there are a couple of things. One is that we did um, do a request for information process. And in the request for information process, which we, for which we had received a grant for, from the um, State Department of Environmental Protection, um, we tried to ascertain um, some of the cost information. And the response, the, um, all of the major haulers that would bid on this kind of request for proposals did respond to the RFI. And we did learn a lot, but um, they didn't give specific price information. And the best we could do, and I um, want to thank uh, the um, staff at uh, our Department of Public Works for um, having done this work, is to go to the communities who are mentioned in those uh, um, RFI responses and ask them for their current contracts. And so we had a number of contracts from the town. So that's where we obtained the information from. And uh, that was in the initial process, plus information that we've obtained from uh, conferences and other places. And what was um, very obvious in all of that is, in the, is particularly the MMA conference, that a competitive process in bidding um, does yield um, a better price than uh, you would get without competitive bidding. But there is one thing that I want to remind um, everybody both in this room and in the community about, and that is um, costs for everything are going up. And um, when we look at the key factors that are involved in waste hauling, which is labor and equipment and what is called tipping fees, which is the expense of actually taking the trash that's collected and, and uh, sending it out to um, be disposed of now increasingly out of state. Um, all of those things are going up in cost. And uh, so that regardless of the process that takes place, we're sort of dealing with two things at the same time that is going to make it difficult because we have to recognize that um, we're, we're trying to instill a competitive process, but we're also trying to instill a competitive process at a time when uh, the cost of providing the service that we're seeking is increasing and the cost of uh, trash hauling is going to increase if we do nothing uh, because it's, it's just the nature of what the business is right now. So I think that we do need to sort of understand that and do the best that uh, we can. And uh, I think that the last comment I'm going to make is, uh, you know, I use the transfer station. I'm very committed to keeping the transfer station open. 
Um, I also recognize that there's an unknown factor in, um, in that is, is the number of households that are going to be served in the contract going to reduce bid, uh, the price that is bid on the contract. And that's a very difficult balance that we're going to have to try and come to grips with. But that's something that we're going to have to work with with our community and in the entire council. But we don't have that information. We can't get that information until we start this process moving to the next stage. Councilor Haneke. Well, as I hinted at, this is not a motion I can support. What are the proposed changes to the general bylaw? What would they include? What might they include? What are we referring to? This motion doesn't list any of it. It doesn't list anything we've just talked about. It doesn't say it would be based on anything we've talked about. It's vague and could be interpreted to include anything. And I think we owe our constituents more clarity than that. Uh, I'm going to wait to hear from people, but I am prepared to make a motion to basically replace it with a different one. Um, but I want to go back to something both Andy and Jennifer just said about these, what is being proposed, because that's not what's in the motion, but that's what people seem to say should be included in the motion. Um, Number five, the transfer station would remain open, but its role in the waste management program has yet to be determined. That's what the statement says, but it is that statement directly is in direct contradiction to what I've heard two TSO members say tonight, which is we are committed to the transfer station staying open and for people who use it for waste hauling to be able to do so. That means that TSO is not leaving open the role in the waste management program of the transfer station. Maybe it's leaving open a portion of that role, but it seems to be, members seem to be saying that they are not, leave, although one member said we would not leave that role open, people who have bought the sticker and deposit their Household trash and recyclables and compost at the transfer station right now would continue to be able to do so. We then heard another TSO member say, well, we actually want to know whether that's actually feasible and whether people would bid on the system if we did that, because maybe that's not enough economies of scale. It's left to be open. And I don't think we should be promising people that they wouldn't not, they would not be able to do that, especially with statements like, but its role in the waste management program has yet to be determined. That's a conversation I think we should have. And if we as a council say, well, maybe we do need to know costs before we say, yes, sticker users will be able to keep their sticker or no, they will not. We shouldn't say, yes, they will in these meetings. Um, I'll wait to hear from more, but I still might decide to make a motion to amend. Um, thank you. Again, exercising my right to speak. I actually had another motion that I had sent to Athena. I just sent her an update of that because I wanted it to be a whole lot more specific that so that it would include the elements that we discussed tonight. And so... I would like to share that motion. It would be, a, again, a substitute motion. Um, and I ask Athena to put it up. You just sent one? I just sent you a change, a slight changes. Did you get it? Hmm. Well, let me try it again. Hold on. Let me 
it's very long. I tried it again. Yeah. Um, I've been asked if we could have a recess. I think we should while we do, maybe by then the email will arrive. It's 841. Let's assume we're going to reconvene at 850. Okay. Um, Lynn, sorry. Can I have a point of order? It's Alicia. I have my camera off. Sorry, because I'm having connectivity issues. But isn't there a motion on the floor that was made and seconded? seconded? There is. So are we just holding to vote on that motion or are we going to be putting a new motion on the table i'm going to share my substitute motion and then we'll see okay okay thank you okay thank you uh we're on break until 8 50. please turn your cameras off and your mics off Did it come through yet? So they said we don't have the information. Yeah, I know. It's a circular thing. Oh. We've missed you at the last time. Oh, things, things have been busy at work, I guess. Exactly. Oh, I'm sorry. Seems like you're working at a uh, at a place that has a lot of activity going on right now. That's part of the activity. But is, is it exciting being at the place that's growing that fast? It's exciting about the opportunity. I heard. Doing a good job of the time service. 
so we have been trying to understand the time. So uh, I think we have a bit of a hard time to get it all in. That's part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Seven from where you can watch the go where you are. And, uh, we never had time to do more than this. We have one idea. We are not Yeah, I mean, I you jump you jump the gun on this. Can we have a Yeah. Besides the screen, the screen. Email. I think there's no jurisdiction of the legislature. One zero. They were very sympathetic. Yeah. Alex, I think that's the very part of the question. Something about it that we have to think about what that could be. Yeah. And, you know, if our own employees would like us to do something about their wages that we can only do with the town manager negotiates. So we'd like they'd like something about their rent papers. Mm -hmm. We can't do that either because most of what the court bill allows us to rent control. I would love to see rent control. Oh, I would really love to see it. I think I should, I'm going to regret that I just did this. <laughs> I know I've been uh, this is this, this has been my life. It's just uh,
We're going to re be reconvening, please. So as you come back, please put your camera on. As you return, please put your camera on. But you should leave your mics off. Okay, it's 8.55. Um, Alicia, if you're here, um, Councillor Ette, if you're here, I mean, oh, sorry, Councillor Walker and Councillor Ette, please turn your videos on so I know you're here. Thank you. There we go. Uh, okay, I have, uh, I don't know what's going on with my email, so I have now conferred with the clerk of the town council and she's going to put my motion up and I will read it. Please make it large enough so I can. My motion is to advise the town manager to propose a plan that includes the following and that said plan may include consultant services. One, identifying the key features of a waste hauler program. Two, conducting community outreach regarding proposed key features of a waste hauler program. Three, developing a proposed bylaw regulations and an RFP for a waste hauler program based upon community and council feedback. Four, developing and implementing a community education and outreach program for implementation of the program. And let me just say this, this allows the town manager, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to seek a second. Second. Okay. Uh, this allows the town manager to work with TSO, which is where this responsibility still lies, and decide, gee, our staff could do this, or our staff won't do this, but we need the services for this, and we need the services for that. What I want to make sure is that we don't lose sight of the fact that we still need to define the program and we still need to do the community outreach. And then we go out when with an RFP for the actual services and the bylaw. Um, the motion's been made and seconded. There is also another motion on the floor. So Jennifer. I just want to say the town manager has told us in TSO that he has no bandwidth, he or his staff, mm -hmm. to do this, That's which is why. So this won't happen. This that, which, No, it says it, to advise him to do that. But he can also say, I'm going to go out for consultant services for the whole thing. He, and by the I, way, he's pretty much told us he will say that, that okay. which is why he's, we proposed that. not here tonight. I can't, you know, he's, I can say to advise the town manager to re to let an RFP for the following four services. But I didn't want to bind the hand. So I guess I can't speak for him, but he's come to TSO and that, that's how we I, came I to mean, issue if, this. If you would like to amend the motion to just say to advise him to put out an RFP for this, because based on what you've had at TSO, that's fine. I, I, I actually have not had that conversation. So, okay. Uh, Alicia. Um, I was going to say something very similar to Jennifer, that my understanding of the reason why we're taking this route with the proposal is because of the feedback we got from the town manager um, and because he has told us that they don't have capacity unless the council is specifically asking for these things to happen um, because we tried 
to move this through the council, I think on a different track, but it didn't work out for those exact reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm slightly unclear about the policy we're using as it regards to motions on the floor, because I thought that when one motion is on the floor, you can't speak to another motion. And so I'm wondering at this point, since we have two motions on the floor, can I call the question on the first motion Athena, I'm going to defer to you. I understood your motion to be uh, an amendment by substitution. Yes. So the motion that's in front of the council right now is an amendment by substitution. Your amendment on to the is motion. by substitution. Okay. So this is the motion. So on there, the floor. there are not two motions on the floor. Thank you. The substitute motions on the floor as an amendment to the original motion. Alicia, so the vote answer? would be. Sorry. Um. Did so if answer? the vote that is happening would be to substitute this motion for the other motion, not to accept this motion? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, but there are there's some suggestions and both you and Jennifer have made suggestions that it should have, as I originally actually had it, it said to advise the town manager to issue a request for proposals for the following services. Maybe we should just return to that. Uh, George, no, Kathy, you're next, I'm sorry. Uh, since we're, we seem to be talking off this one, I thought you were gonna propose something quite different, um, but in the original one, my concern with it is it didn't say the RFP would include the following key features. I think to turn all of this over to a consultant to identify the key features when we've been talking about it for two years is crazy. Um, George just gave us a slide that had key features in it. So um, I am uncomfortable of going this route. I would be comfortable in having the other motion say uh, that would include the following key features or see slide number two with key features because um, this turns everything over to a consultant after two years of discussion. Um, I do think I totally agree with what Freca said and what you've said and then what several members of the public is we need to start doing community outreach. And what I thought we would do with a district one meeting that we're trying to set up is not invite just the advocates in, but use the slides that George just had, I can amend them to say, these are the elements that are under consideration and get feedback on them. Um, and I think people are gonna wonder what the cost is, which is why I thought we were going out with an RFP to get our best sense of what people would bid. So this, this doesn't get to an RFP until a really long time um, and so the community outreach without any information about the cost impact seems uh, premature other than to find out everybody wants to find out, know what the cost would be to them. You know, do I have to participate? Can I do this? Can I do that? And we won't have any answers to it. So I am not in favor of this as currently worded. I also was not in favor of the other one being broad rather than mentioning and key features would include, because um, I don't think we should turn everything over to a consultant. Elaine, I'll respond to your questions later. It, and I'm sorry for your misinformation. Thank you. George. Well, I don't think I can support this either, but I also want to make the point in response to Kathy that we're not turning this over to a consultant. Uh, this is something that TSO will be uh, involved in uh, very much so. Um, so it's not like we're just handing the ball to a consultant and say, here, craft the bylaw, bring it back to us, and we're going to then bring it to the council. Um, so uh, I prefer the original motion. Um, it doesn't have any specifics, um, it's, but it gives you a sense of a roadmap that we, TSO, are going to follow. We will be continuing to be in constant contact with the council. Um, it's a process. It's going to take time. Uh, it's also going to cost money. Um, this, I think, items one and two are already things that, well, item one, we've already done that. Um, item two, uh, as Kathy pointed out, and I think she's right, uh, we can't really do a lot of community outreach right now because we don't have a lot to tell them. 
Uh, you're right. Probably the first question is going to be how much it's going to cost, but there are going to be lots of other questions. Is the transfer station going to stay open? What's its role going to be? Um, we need to get some answers to those questions. We need uh, expert help to do that. Um, I think you have to trust the process. You have to trust TSO. Um, and in the end, you will have the final say. You'll have the final say, first of all, over the consultant fee, because Paul will have to come to you and ask for the money. And you'll have the final say over a bylaw, which can be amended and adjusted as you see fit. But we can't get there uh, without uh, this moving forward. And we need uh, your help tonight to do that. So I would urge us to keep with the original motion. I can't support this. Councilor Haneke. Um, I'm not sure I can support this motion either because it doesn't, as Councillor Shane said, as Kathy said, list the key features. Um, but I also couldn't support changing, if someone were to do it, the to advise the manager to propose a plan to, to propose an RFP because my understanding of our prior conversation before this motion was proposed was that we wanted to limit the RFP to certain services and this would really expand it beyond those services to um, not just developing the RFP, but doing the community outreach, I potentially, potentially doing all of these things. Um, and that would be yeah. a lot more money. Um, and then number four assumes that the program will be adopted. And so it seems premature to put number four in this at all. Um, uh, if it fails, I'm prepared to propose a motion to amend um, by substitution, one that would include key features. Jennifer? Um, yes, I just want to add, make two comments that the motion that, that and, Andy introduced was um, voted on unanimously to recommend was recommended by TSO. Mm -hmm. I also I received an email from a, a constituent who is knowledgeable about this, and it says that Amherst trash services are not paid from the general fund, and tra trash service can't be mandated to all residents. It is a fee for service situation, and by state law, there must be an alternative for residents, and that is why we have the transfer station. So the transfer station probably can't be closed. And when Andy mentioned, we'll see how it would be managed, that would be, would some of its hours that it's open be changed? So when we say we're committed to the transfer station being open, we also have to offer an, that kind of an option to the residents. Thank you. Um, first of all, I build on George. This would totally continue to work with TSO. Second, because of what I'm hearing from what TSO has said, the town manager has said, it would be an RFP. My idea would be that it would be a menu RFP. Whether it includes all four elements or only three, that's something the town manager or the council can you know, advise him to do. My goal is to be a little more specific and define a process that at least forces us to put those key elements out there and agree to them. And for everybody who's sitting here with pricing, all these communities are doing this. What are they paying? This is a matter of finding out what people are paying. I don't understand why we need to go to an RFP to find out what other people are paying for the same service. It's to me, having spent 40 years in the world of grants and contracts, you need to define what you want before you go out to the public with an RFP, because otherwise they don't know how to respond. And I, Guilford, I know you disagree with me. So, Guilford. Oh, I was just gonna say, yes, I disagree. We went out with an RFI. We got the information that was available at the time. Some of that information was dated and communities were re-establishing re and renegotiating contracts. So that is a bit old. We've had con contractors in the RFI who said, we will not do it if this, this, and this are there. But they would not give us the current price they would do it because it was not a proposal to ask for a price. 
We gave they gave us current contracts and we have information from current contracts, some of which have already expired. So if we want current prices to go forward to the community, it's, we have to go to an RFP and say, what are your prices and let's hold firm. I have a project now that I'm asking for more money for because we went to the vendors that do this work and they gave us a price. Two months later, the price is now $40,000 more because things have changed. So unless we have a process where we can lock them in and say, give us a proposal, this proposal is good for this many months, or in this case, we'll probably be for 18 months before we start, um, we're not going to have firm prices for people this, to talk about. So I, I really think you need to ask, we need to ask for the RFP to do this. And we do not have the bandwidth. My office does not have the bandwidth to do it. If you want to give us the $50,000 to hire someone part-time to do it, that would be okay. But I think you, we need to go to a consultant who's done a few of these and has worked and can put it together and and put us in the right direction. And I'm sorry that was winded and it was kind of loud. I apologize. Thank you. Okay. I'm I'm willing to withdraw the motion. Let's see what uh, Councillor Haneke has to say. Is the person who seconded it willing to withdraw it? I was the second and I will withdraw too. Thank you. Please take the motion down. What would you like on the screen, Councillor Haneke? I didn't know I was still recognized. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I have emailed it to you, Athena, not in a great form, um, but it is based on the what is being proposed slide, which I think is number six in that presentation um, to help you with the typing. Um, so this is a motion to substitute, um, well, to amend by substitution the following motion. To advise the town manager to issue a request for proposals RFP in accordance with the below goals in anticipation of revising general bylaw 3.33 refuse collection and recyclable materials. One, town would negotiate and contract with a waste hauler or haulers on behalf of residents for collection of household trash, unlimited recyclables, and compostables. Two, the contract would include a robust pay-as-you-throw feature stru fee structure. Three, Curbside composting would be made available to all residents. Four, transfer station could remain open, but its role in the waste management program has yet to be determined, but contract could include and outline separately as an add-on provision of current transfer station services. Five, program would be phased in beginning with, phased in beginning with single family and two, three, and four unit properties expanding to all residential properties within three years, Six, haulers must provide an annual report to the town on the weight in tons of trash, recyclables, and compostables collected within the town. Seven, an advantage in awarding a contract would be given to haulers who dispose of compost locally. The there a second? Se made and seconded. Yes. Is there a second? A second. Yes. Thank you. The floor is now open for discussion. Our Mandy Joe, would you like to please speak to your motion? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, what you're seeing on the screen, the crossouts are changes to what was on the what is proposed slide. The lowercase letters are the additions to what is what would be changed from that slide to make it easier to see what I'm amending from that what is being proposed slide. Um, I believe we should not pass a motion that is not somewhat clear on what we want out of this program, which means we have to agree on some of the things we want while also leaving it somewhat open. It's one of the reasons I combined the original what is being proposed slide one and two into one to allow for hauler or haulers. Um, and some of those other changes were, were made for the same reasons. But I think we do need to outline some of our goals and that's what this does. Anna. One of the questions raised earlier that I, I think is a really interesting one to ask, and I'm not sure how, how to ask it in a way that helps us in this process is about soliciting uh, responses to an RFP that don't necessarily require all three of the services, the trash recycling and composting. And I'm curious, this was, it was mentioned, and I'm curious if that's something the council wants to explore of if someone 
wants to offer just composting and someone else offers trash and recycling. Is that something that is doable? I'm not sure if that's doable through this motion. And I just wanted to bring that up if that's something the, the council would like to discuss further as an opportunity or as an option. Um, it, for me, it feels possibly beneficial, but potentially confusing. Um, but it had, men, had, had been mentioned before. And so I wanted to, to bring it back around because I don't think that this motion, the way it's written, would allow for that. Thank you. Kathy? I want to thank Mandy for doing this because I thought that's what was missing from the original motion, um, that we didn't have a list. And we got a list tonight. Um, we, I don't think we need the full rewrite of the bylaw because it's listing elements. So I think the the only thing that is missing from this wording, I'm ass assuming that the town manager was saying, I need a consultant to help me write this RFP. So Mandy, we don't have the word, a consultant to do the RFP anywhere that we're asking them to. So he would have to ask us for that. But I think it's smart to list the elements. And as to Anna's, um, the RFP could be worded that if you're willing to do some but not all, please tell us and give us a price on that. So that could be a decision in writing the RFP. Um, it would be an alternative. And I don't know whether we would want um, one of the things that was remarked to me when I first ran for council, for someone who just moved to Amherst, on how many, they have a little street, how many trucks were going down their street every day, because we still had different waste haulers. So someone would come on Tuesday, someone would come on Wednesday, so go to a different house each day. Um, so I don't think we want different trucks rolling down the street, one to pick up the recyclables, another to pick up the compostables, another to pick up the trash. So you would rather have it all in a bundle if we're going to be offering that kind of pickup. So I wouldn't rewrite this to say, suppose you just want to do one piece of it. Um, but I think if we're going to go forward with this, and that was what I thought the intent was, um, going out to see what kind of bids we get, we're going to have to give the consultant guidelines, which is what this does, to what is the RFP asking for. And then we should look for towns, as I said at the beginning, towns that are doing all of the following use them as a model for the way of wording this RFP so people know what we're so the bidders know what we're talking about um our words not I don't know whether everybody uses what's what's the word in here the pay as you throw the the p-a-y-t <laughs> you know it's a cute little acronym that gets explained each time but normal people wouldn't know what a p-a-y-t is um so just making sure the con the RFP is written clearly. Um, so I prefer this to the original one, and I think it gets to what some of what Lynn was trying to do is putting more specifics in to what we're doing in RFP for. So I uh, I like this change. Jennifer, yes, I like this too. Um, I would just um, agree with Kathy if it could say to advise the town manager to retain a consultant to issue an RFP, because that's what Paul um, communicated to TSO that he would like. But with adding those words, I'm very comfortable with this. So you would like to put in the words to advise the town manager to retain a consultant to develop? To develop, right, is he the consultant An RFP. And I think they would, as I can't remember who I think as as Kathy um, requested that the RFP be shared with TSO or um, maybe just the chair of TSO if it can't be made public. But um, this was Councillor Haneke's motion. Councillor Haneke, do you agree with that addition? Where'd she go? I no, I'm here. I'm thinking. Um, okay. I'm confused by the desire to require this addition when the original motion didn't have this in it at all. It did, didn't it? No, it didn't. It didn't talk about hiring a consultant at all. Um, at least, no, I, I don't believe it did. Um, it didn't. Yes, it did. 
Uh, the original motion was to advise the town manager to issue a request for proposals on behalf of proposed changes to general bylaw 3.3.3. Yeah. Okay. I, I take back what I said because I thought it had the word consultant in it. Um, yeah. I guess he told TSO he needed a consultant to do it. So, uh, Councillor Haneke, did you have anything else you wanted to add? You don't want. You so I'm I'm not willing to just accept that as a friendly amendment because it changes what the original one was asking for too. But it could be a motion to amend this. Okay. Um Jennifer, no, who was the person that made the motion <coughs> that suggested that, Jennifer? I did. So I have a question to my fellow TSO. Yeah. Um is it, well or to everybody, does this mean the town manager would have to come back to us to ask? Or would he he would have to come back to ask for the specific funding authorization? He does have to do that because this is not in this year's so budget. I, I just don't want to delay the process with him having to come and ask right. for. So would that do that if it's not included, or would he just know he can come back? Can he can come back and ask for the funding authorization? He would have to. Right. So he can go to that step without having to come back in between. Yes, he can. Okay. But that does not resolve the issue that the the town manager and our direct our superintendent of DPW has said they need a consultant to write this RFP. Right. So I guess this is my question: Would he have? Would the town manager? He knows he needs a consultant. So can he just come back to us as he? You're saying even if we include the words "retain a consultant" in this motion, he still has to come back for the. Um, expenditure authorization for the, yes for the appropriation so if if we don't have the word retain a consultant here i guess do we have to, i mean he will he just know he can retain a consultant you know i guess yeah that that seems to be what the original motion said jennifer i i imagined the word consultants in it but i'm reading even the one before it was changed again it never had yeah, I think in the last TSO meeting, we specifically talked about a consultant and some, it did not make it into the motion language that's in the packet. So I also put this out to my fellow members of TSO. So right now there is no motion on the floor to amend this. George. So I can, I can live with this. Um, I understand the the impulse to perhaps be a bit more specific and have a sense of, um, you know, concretely in black and white, what the kind of map is going forward. Um, I have a little issue with four and just the language. Transfer station could remain open, um, but its role in the waste management program has yet to be determined, but contract could include um, I think you'd want to say the contract would include, but again, Mandy can correct me if I'm misinterpreting her, and outline separately as an add-on provision of current transfer station services. I, I, I'm not super happy with the could, but I think I can live with it. Um, I, it was meant in the way this was written to suggest that we really don't have a clear sense of what the final role will be. That's where we need help. And we need to do some thinking. But um, I guess the only change I would suggest, if it seems sensible, is to change this, change the second could to would. Uh, in other words. So the number four would read transfer station could remain open. Could remain open. Okay. But its role in the waste management program has yet to be determined, but contract must or may. Uh, I I think it, I would have to say must or should include. Then, it, then you just change it at the beginning. I don't know. Shall I, remain open or may, you know. May we can leave it as it is. I, I don't know what Mandy's thoughts are. Stinks the way it is. Well, this, I'm sorry. So what do you suggest? Would the second I'm becomes saying. a would? Or you want to. The transfer station would remain open, but its role in the waste management program will be determined. I, no, that's Has yet to be determined. So and its role shall be determined. Go for it. I need I need somebody to come up with the language that you'd like 
to put in here, and then we need to see if the person offering the motion is will accept that. I understand. So could I speak to that language? Sorry? Yes. So I absolutely admit that is the worst written sentence of these seven. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> your fault. You're working on a week. Yeah. Um, I I was trying to get to the point of if a contractor during these RFPs or should we use the RFP to to determine whether a contractor could provide all of the services the transfer station does, and if that is the case, then maybe the transfer station does not stay open. And I, I acknowledge that I did hear Jennifer say we might have to anyway. I don't know the law around it. Um, but the woods sort of seem to me to indicate musts in a sense. And so that's why I put the coulds in there of trying to leave open, you know, when, when you say the transfer station would remain open, but its role is yet to be determined, well, that role might be nothing, but it stays open, you know, and so could remain open, but acknowledge that maybe the contract itself would actually provide all those services. So maybe it wouldn't remain open that basically the transfer station status is completely up in the air and we need the RFP to address the options. So maybe just transfer station could remain open, but its role in the waste management system has yet to be determined, period. And trust TSO and trust the process that, that this uh, these options would definitely be at the very forefront rather than trying to work it into it here. Simply change the would to could to reflect the reality that at this time we just don't know. And uh, maybe the state will require it um, and that will determine it. Um, maybe, but maybe we just leave it as could and stop it with a period as yet to be determined. Would you live with that, Mandy? Um, I could live with that as long as we explain that to Paul when this makes it to Paul, that the goal is to explore all of those options. Okay. okay. But remember, a transcript of a meeting is always part of the record for the person for interpretation. Um, so we're striking from the word determined off. Is that correct? And the person well, that's seconded? After the word determined in number four. It's, act, it's after the word determined. Leave the word determined. Hang on for a minute. No, right there. Is the person that seconded, do you agree, Anna? I, yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andy? Yeah, I'm going to speak very briefly, and I'm going to speak as and uh, make it clear that I am not speaking as chair of the committee because I can't uh, represent the committee on a position that we've never discussed in a meeting or taken a vote on. So... As an individual, um, I'm satisfied with the proposal to change, uh, to amend the motion that I had originally made, uh, And but I want to leave it to be voted on because um, I was trying to hear to the committee in the first one. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, just point out is that I uh, appreciate the words waste hauler or haulers to give which gives the option that it could go to one or more and just share with you real quickly that i've done a lot of work on researching programs in other communities all over the state and i don't have the exact number in my head but it is around 30 communities that have um, compost programs and i have uh, looked at the website and researched every one of them. And uh, virtually all of them have a separate um, vendor that is picking up the compost from picking up the rest of the trash. And that's because um, there are specialty companies, it, the, it, one in particular um, that unfortunately does not serve Western Massachusetts that does um, that as a specialty. And so they serve a, a good number of those communities are communities that are served by black earth composting. Uh, now, given the fact we're in a different part of the state, I don't know if that'll be possible, but I think it's worth having that option out there because uh, it seems to work elsewhere. 
Pat? We're not reducing the number of trucks that are gonna be coming down the street. Right now on Wednesdays, the first truck comes and picks up all of the garbage. The second truck comes later in the day and picks up the recyclables. And whether it's an independent composting thing or the same company picking up compost, I guarantee you that'll be a third truck. So saying we're gonna reduce the number of trucks on the road is not accurate. Okay. George, you still have your hand up. I'm, I know it's late. I know we need to move on. Yeah, I just, I'm struggling with number four. I, um, I'm, yes, it, and it I, just from the sense that, I mean, what I basically would be saying is that we will make it clear to Paul when we talk to him that the services currently offered by the uh, transfer station um, must be included in any um, contract with a hauler. Um, and maybe it does make sense for us to include that language so that we're all on the same page tonight. Um, otherwise, you're trusting. I think you have good reason to trust, but nonetheless, you're trusting that when we speak to him, we will make it clear to him that um, in any kind of contract or RP, um, it, these services that the, the transfer station provides um, must be included um, so we can we can compare apples to apples. Can I suggest, George, because this is exactly what I wanted to speak to. It seems to me that what we've heard from people is they want the transfer station. We've also heard that maybe there's a state law that says there has to be an alternative. So why don't we just say the, the transfer station will remain open, period. I think we're just, at least I'm not certain what the state law is. Uh, I know Jennifer and I've heard this and, but I just would like to know for sure. And I don't think we're not gonna determine that tonight that the state actually would require, we're gonna have to do more research to determine what the state uh, will or will not allow. Um, so I think to say something will be the case, unless we actually know it's the case, um, is premature. I think we have to leave it the way Mandy has it um, for the moment. Um, I think it's either way we can live with it. Um, my concern is just that, that Paul be clear and we are clear that um, the services which are very valuable to this community that the transfer station offers, um, especially with bulk waste, yard waste, et cetera, um, must be included in any RFP to find out what these folks will provide and what they won't. Um, that's my concern, but I don't think you can change this to will. But then why don't, why are we saying it could remain open? Why aren't we saying it would remain open? Again, we're making a prediction with the language um, and to which, yeah. as Mandy points out, we're not really justified in making. We just don't know. We just don't know. Right. I personally hope it will stay open, um, but we just don't know. Okay. Uh, I have another question that's totally unrelated. Is there anybody, it can, Councilor Haneke, did you want to speak to this one? Yeah, so, so we don't know, Lynn, because a contract could say, you know, what I want the RFP to do is say, hey, if we asked you to provide, could you provide, you know, bulk pickup on the curbside at the request of certain people, you know, on a phone call? Some some haulers do that now. And if you did that, what would the cost be? You know, and to see if we had to keep the transfer station open. I don't know whether we do or whether if we say we're going to keep it open for, say, you know, sticker people and trash hauling, Will that stop people from bidding? I don't know. And so I'm trying to give the the most options that will also through, you know, it's not the greatest wording, but will also give us the most information about what is most feasible and the costs of each of those options. Um, I wanted to respond to Councillor DeAngelis's thing about truck reduction. It is not a given that it wouldn't reduce trucks because maybe we would contract for biweekly trash pickup or biweekly recyclable pickup or biweekly compost pickup, not weekly on all of them. And if they all became biweekly, you would reduce the number of trucks. So we can't say one way or the other. It's possible, it's possible it wouldn't, but it all depends on 
if, if you succeed in reducing all of the waste that's thrown, you don't need weekly pickup. <laughs> it just, you just don't. Um, and so I, I think it's inaccurate to say one way or the other that it, it might reduce the number of trucks, but it might not. That, so I want to go back to a question that's totally separate. Pam, did you want to speak to this? Go, oh, please go ahead. Okay, speaking to number four, I think the, the use of the word could is appropriate. As has been stated, we don't actually know what configuration we would end up with. And it could be that the that the landfill is, I mean, the, uh, the transfer station is needed only for, you know, those mattresses and those things that you simply can't get rid of any other way, but all other services may may change and go to this contractor. So I want to use the word could and uh, and, not, and def definitely not the word will or shall. Um, I just, it just needs to be flexible. I hope it stays open, but it's not a guarantee, right? Okay, so nowhere, in, I, I want to know if in any of these, there is something that suggests we want them to tell us how they will administer the program, how they'll do customer service, et cetera. And and I don't I don't know if it's there, but it seems to me that one of the questions that was mentioned earlier today is, you know, who's gonna do the billing, who's gonna do the customer service, who's gonna do take the phone calls when something's wrong. And uh, that doesn't appear in these bullets to my knowledge, maybe somebody else sees it. Uh, that's one issue. The other issue I have, and I still have all along in here, is this is the first time we as a council have looked at this list tonight, just tonight. Have we taken it to the public? No. That's my problem. Councilor Haneke? So to respond to the billing issue and all, um, if you, the top of this says in accordance with the below goals, I'm not sure the council has a goal on billing. Mm -hmm. So I don't think That's we right. can set forth the goal within this motion. Um, this isn't meant to be a comprehensive, the only things that will be in an RFP is this list of seven. This is sort of the goals of the RFP are these seven, but obviously, you know, even the presentation had more things in it. It will never get comprehensive. Um, and and we we maybe we could add things that say an RFP that de the RFP wouldn't even really determine who does the billing in a sense. Um, you know, we could figure out wording. If you want wording in there, maybe the best option to do tonight is to refer this back to TSO. Uh, Pam, you have your hand up. You took it down. George, you have your hand up. I think as we all know that we are elected to listen, and we do. But I think we're also elected to lead. And sometimes leading means stepping out in front and saying, this is the direction we think we should go in. And, um, and that is what this is trying to do. And it seems like there's general agreement that this is the direction in which we should go. And um, we so we can bring the public along with us if you believe in as i do that this is the direction in which we should go not all the details are here as mandy pointed out there are many that simply can't be here um, for a whole host of reasons but this is the broad map um and i think i've heard enough tonight um and this has not been this is not new it's been around for quite some time there are no real big surprises here um and we've gone through this now with a fine tooth comb um it may not be perfect but it's pretty damn close to it um, I think we need to move forward. I think we need to vote this and, and get to work. Okay. The motion's been made and seconded. Are there any other comments? Seeing none. Uh, uh, yeah. Councilor Ette. Aye. I'm going to hold. I'm, I, I'm not saying one way or another yet. Um, I'm sorry, my sheet 
did not print properly, so I have to go back. So, uh, Councilor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner is absent. Councilor Lord? Uh, aye. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Um, Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Dowen Gothier? Aye. And Aline Griesmer is an aye. So it is unanimous with one absent. Okay. Uh, we are going no, on. I, to... I actually have a point of order for, <laughs> yeah. uh, for um, Athena. Uh, was that a, a vote on the motion to amend? Yes. And if so, oh. then we need to vote one yes. more time on the right. actual on motion. On the actual motion, yes. Thank you. So it was the motion to amend. We now need to go to the actual motion, which is what's on the screen. And we begin to we begin with Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Um, Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner is absent. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. C Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Rette. Aye. It's unanimous. Okay. We are now going on to the nuisance property bylaw 3.26. This is a first reading. This has been with GOL. I mean, I'm sorry, it has been both with CRC on a couple of occasions. It was done as a complement to the rental registration bylaw, and then it has gone to GOL. So I'm going to start by calling on uh, Pam Rooney for the CRC report. Thank you, you stole my thunder. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanna make one correction that the date of the, the GOL voted document should be September 5. Yep. It's listed as September 6, but I know you voted on September 5. Um, so in the packet, you were provided with the clean copy and the marked up version that came out of GOL with our uh, um, town attorney, KP Law, uh, input, and it was voted uh, out of GOL back to us here um, for consideration. Uh, when we, when CRC started work on the rental registration bylaw, two two plus years ago, uh, that was intended to help with the health and safety of tenants and and the uh, conditions, living conditions, primarily in town. The second um, bylaw that has come out of that effort is an update of the current nuisance bylaw. And it is intended to help uh, ensure that folks in the neighborhood also are able to continue the enjoyment of their residences. So this is sort of health of neighborhoods. The first is health of tenants. Um, the content of the document that you um, have for <coughs> for consideration and voting next round, next meeting. Um, the goal of this nuisance property bylaw is not to penalize people, but in fact to correct actions that disturb the quiet enjoyment of folks' residents. The existing bylaw, 3.26, uh, is titled Nuisance House, and Nuisance House focuses heavily on the control of gatherings and underage drinking activity. That was that was the, the premise under which it was first constructed. This updated and retitled uh, bylaw is called nuisance property, and it addresses a broader array of activities that comprise unreasonable interference with the quiet enjoyment of one's home residents. Um, it does not differentiate between a rented or an owner-occupied home, it clarifies owner and manager responsibilities upon a third violation. It provides opportunity for the removal of a nuisance designation with corrective action. And it includes uh, activities that are deemed violations of state law, like possession and underage drinking, 
violations of local zoning bylaw, which might include something like excessive lighting or parking, and then general bylaw, which is noise, road, road obstruction, littering, and refuse collection. So the CRC has worked long and hard on this and would appreciate your support when it comes to a vote um, at the next meeting. If there are any questions, let us know. Well, I'm going to ask uh, GOL to make their report and then go for questions. So GEO always asked to review this for clarity, consistency, and actionability. We first looked at it, I believe, in April. Um, and at that point, we had requested a review from KP Law. Um, the KP Law review led to a lot of questions that GOL felt were beyond the scope of clarity, consistency, and actionability. So we sent it back to CRC to answer those questions. Um, it then came back through KP Law with a second review to us. Um, and we reviewed it a second time on September 5th, um, and we voted it clear, consistent, and actionable. I also want to thank um, Chief Ting for joining us at that meeting and uh, providing some context from his perspective uh, in, the, in the public safety world. Okay. Thank you. Uh, questions? Kathy? I'm, actually, uh, there is no motion on the floor. Kathy? Um yeah, I have I have questions, um, and I guess it's a question slash comment. Um, it's starting with it's three hundred dollar fine, and it's not clear to me whether it's three hundred dollars per incident, or it's three hundred dollars per person per incident. So, like if there's uh, uh, cars parked all over the place, and there are fifteen people, and there's trash, is it fifteen times three hundred? And then there's a, a concept of one strike, two strikes, and then three strikes within a town. So at the third thing, it says then it's the organizer, the people involved, and the owner. So it sounds like several people are now responsible, but I didn't know whether that meant several people are being fined. What is happening to those those entities? It doesn't it doesn't tell me. What about year two? Um, if we really have a nuisance house that seems to be not con well controlled and it's a rental and since contracts for rent tends to be one year and then year two, it's another problem. At what point does their permit get pulled at which it would be a club? And it's nowhere in this that the permit for the property actually gets terminated. Um, and I believe there was a discussion about that at, at, during CRC. I think it's, there needs to be something other than you're a nuisance and you've been labeled a nuisance with a big, whatever, red letter on top of your house. It'd be a red red N. You're, you're the N house, um, the nuisance house. Um, but it's not clear to me, after one, after two, after three, what is the increase in penalty? Clearly, the police being called out, fire chiefs being called out, it's costing the town money each time someone is going out to respond to these incidents. So that's my basic, like, is it per incident? Is it times the number of people? Does the penalty get bigger because more people have to pay the penalty? And why not include, at some point, um, you lose your rental permit. And I, I'd be okay if it's year two. You know, you you had this problem all during year one, but year two, you could have a new set of tenants and and make sure they're not behaving as first set. The landlord may not be able to control, they got bad tenants and most landlords don't want really bad tenants. Um, so year two or year three. But I just, you know, I looked for more of a club in the rental inspection, which seems to impose inspections on places where nothing wrong is going wrong with them. Um, and I didn't like that aspect of the bureaucracy here. I would like it to be stronger. So I don't understand how it works and why it's not stronger after three incidents in one year. Those are my two basics. You know, what is is it 300 times five people? And then it, the fine starts to be get to be really big. And then when it gets to be the owner, does every, is everyone paying in? Or are they all being 
um, given their that you're a nuisance. So that's my basic, I don't understand how it functions. And why not when it's a nuisance house after one year or after two years that nothing gets cleared up and it's a rental, why not pull the rental permit? Why is there no bigger consequence? I'm through with it. Thank and you. I, I think it's too weak is, uh, and or it's unclear, it's vague on what the consequences would be. George. So I voted to declare this clear, consistent, actionable, but I'm not sure I can support it. I'm hoping that the answers to some of my questions, including some of Kathy's questions, will, will convince me otherwise. The first thing I'd like to point out to my colleagues is this bylaw applies to all properties in town, whether they're owner-occupied or leased. So that immediately gets my ears to perk up. Um, and because that means that my property, for instance, could be declared a nuisance property. Um, and I could be subject to all these penalties, which really are quite impressive. Um, so the first question I have has to do um, with uh, Section C and uh, the, the $300 fine. If I understand it, any violation of C2 is deemed a violation of the bylaw and is subject to a $300 fine. Is, is my reading of that correctly? So for instance, if I don't get this ice off my sidewalk um, and I am then, uh, you know, somebody Rabile Dictu actually comes by and, and, and you, know, you know, writes up a ticket, that's now a $300 fine as opposed to what I believe at the moment is a $50 fine. So I have a question about, I mean, under the general bylaws, most of the uh, items you list are $50 fines. There's one that's a $250 fine. None of them, only D is a $300 fine. But if I understand this bylaw, and then maybe I'm just mis not understanding it, um, any one of those violations now is a $300 fine. Um, and if I don't clean the ice off my sidewalk for like five days, it's actually 300 times five. Um, so I have some, cons I mean, I just, help me understand this. Is that actually what it's saying? Or um, because that has me obviously concerned. Um, we don't really enforce that particular bylaw very much, if at all, but it's right on the books and it has a $50 fine. <laughs> Is that now a $300 fine? Um, you could also you know, talk about chunk vehicles. You could talk about a whole host of things. Maybe your dog barks a lot. And finally, somebody comes in and you get a, a, a ticket for a noisy dog. And now it's a $300 fine. I just, uh, I'm concerned about the impact of this, um, first of all, on everybody in town. Um, though I understand the motives perhaps are focused on a particular subset of uh, properties in town. This bylaw applies to everybody. So I have concerns about that, and I just need to have them clarified. Okay. Um, so we've had some questions. Both Councillor Haneke and uh, Pam Rooney are on CRC, which is where this main development lies. So I'm going to go to Councillor Haneke. Uh, my response initially to George is, why shouldn't it apply to your house? If you're hosting a loud party, oh, yeah, can you hear me? Now we can, yes. Okay. Um, my, my answer is why shouldn't it apply to your house? If you're hosting a loud party week after week after week, why shouldn't it be declared a nuisance house? Why should the rules for you be any different because you own the house on terms of how you act in public, act on your property and treat your property than because you rent it? So that's my answer to that. Um, to, to answer the permit question from Kathy, if uh, you're right, this this bylaw does not deal with a rental a residential rental permit because that's in a different bylaw. That other bylaw does say that if your house is currently declared a nuisance property, you must be inspected yearly. If there would if this council would want to add additional potential penalties for a house that is defined as a nuisance property, or a property that that meets the definition or is declared a nuisance um, nuisance property in need of correction, um, that change would need to be done in the residential rental permit bylaw side because it would be a 
a penalty on the residential rental permit. Um, sure. um, violations, fines. So as Chief Ting regularly said to us in CRC, this is a tool. This might not be the very first tool anyone uses if the ice is not moved off the sidewalk, even though that could potentially, if it's never moved off and they've talked to you six times and it's six different ice storms later and you've never done it once, they may choose instead of to find you under the removal obstruction of sidewalk bylaw, they may choose to find you under this bylaw instead. But you have to meet the definition of public nuisance, and and which is defined in B7, an unreasonable interference with a right common to the general public, um, such as a condition dangerous to health, offensive to community moral standards, or that otherwise threatens the general welfare of a neighbor or the town in general, and includes but is not limited to these activities. So it can include those, but it also has to meet the rest of them. It's kind of circular, but it's it's meant to not be applied on a first instance of you didn't do your obstruction. But it's meant if if a, a responding officer or the building commissioner responds to a complaint and you've got your sidewalk obstructed and a junked vehicle in the yard and vegetation and non-hauled waste because the waste and the trash is just collecting, they may say, you know, this collectively is a nuisance property. We're going to put the fine under the nuisance property. Um, someone asked about the fines and whether it's one or all. Each person could be written a ticket, but it's who's written the ticket and each day is a separate violation. So they could fall up and it could be each one and it could be each day, but it all depends on how the tickets are written. Pam Rooney. I think Mandy covered most of it. Um, I think the the original intent was to be able to say if a property is becoming a nuisance, they really shouldn't get the um, the opportunity to rent uh, and and get income from a property if they're not if they're not managing it well. However, as it was stated before, because this is trying to be equitable whether it's a, a rental unit or an owner occupied unit um, we can't take away a permit for an owner occupied premises so we we had to we had to uncouple the um, the nuisance permit excuse me the designation of a nuisance property specifically with that that dwelling being able to be uh, issued a rental registration permit. I didn't say that very well. Anyway, it was to be more equitable. Um, the other the other note is that the chief of police stated several times that this is um, offers some flexibility as a tool for for their department and for uh, the inspection services. And that again, as as Mandy stated, they're able to pick and choose from different situations and what the penalties would be. But we we wanted to be able to provide a corrective action process, but which the current bylaw does not have. And engaging the owners and or managers, um, they, they are notified today. They're notified with the first and second uh, violations but in this bylaw, they're being actually asked to come to the table and create a corrective action plan, which we don't have now. And and there are a number of properties in town that could use one. Thank you. Anna? All right, I got some back of the envelope notes here. Um, for the most part, what throws me about this is that and again, not entirely, but for the most part, this is a law saying that it's now against the law to break other laws, um, which feels just kind of like a head trip or a, a double gotcha, right? It's saying it's a violation of this bylaw to break our other laws um, and to break mass general law. 
um, to break our zoning bylaws. So I think for me, where I'm where I'm struggling with this is similar to George's question, but kind of a different vein is, are you fined for both of them at the same time? So if you violate noise and um, nuisance, is that now $600? Um, so that's kind of the first bigger picture issue that I have with this is, are we just starting to repeat ourselves and spiral? Um, and then I really am having a strong allergic reaction to the phrase offensive to community moral standards. Um, that makes me deeply uncomfortable. Uh, there are plenty of times in our history where community moral standards have been opposed to groups of people. And I know that's not what the intention was here. I'm not at all insinuating that was the intention here, but I think that that phrasing lends itself to too much vagueness. Um, and so I, I'm very uncomfortable with that, that word. It's in the um, section B uh, definitions, B7. And then lastly, um, this is kind of a particular, but this is called a nuisance property bylaw, but this is really, I'm, I'm questioning why the, um, the authors of this didn't call it a public nuisance bylaw, because uh, a nuisance property is only defined in, as a nuisance property if it violates the public nuisance part of this three times. And most of the penalties here are for being a public nuisance, not being a nuisance property. And so I'm I'm just kind of curious about, it might seem like semantics, but as I'm reading this, this is about public nuisance violations. And then it also has the kind of, not caveat, but the part of it that says three public nuisance violations, you're now a nuisance property. So the whole thing isn't about nuisance properties and it feels a little confusing to me. I feel like it should just be called public nuisance bylaw. Um, those are my comments for now. George. So going back to my questions, I guess the answer to the first question is that the depends on the uh, entity that actually tickets you, whether they decide to ticket you under the general bylaw or whether they decide to ticket you or find you criminally liable under the um, nuisance property bylaw. So um, you could be fined $50 for an obstruction of the public way or it could be fined 300 and that's up to the uh, uh, whoever it is that writes the ticket. Um, again, back to the thought that this applies to everybody in town. I wonder how many people in town know that now they're all subject to this nuisance property bylaw. I would venture to say very few. Um, that at least in theory, um, what is a $50 fine could become a $300 fine, depending on the judgment of a, uh, a town official. Um, and that, so that, that concerns me. Uh, how much does the public actually know about this? Um, and how much have we made an effort to tell them that this is coming? Um, again, it seems to me that what this is really aimed at are a certain subset of properties in town, but for whatever reason, um, it's now applies to everybody. Um, so I'm hoping everybody's aware of it, though I doubt that very much. Um, I don't think my constituents are aware of it. Um, they're also, I mean, again, go on and on, but the, uh, the $300 uh, fines keep mounting up here. Um, once you have uh, been designated a nuisance property, you have five days in which to schedule a meeting. Um, if you don't do that, there's a $300 fine, and that continues until you schedule a meeting. A practical question is whether these are calendar days or business days, or does it matter? I'm under the it's charter, one it, would be, the I'm it sorry? would be business days because it's a number less than ten for counting. So charter it's, it's understood to be business days. Yeah, by the charter, it would be business days. Okay, that's well, that's good days. to know. So you have five business days to schedule a meeting, and if you don't, then the penalties start accruing. I'm still thinking of the poor fellow who has his ice on his sidewalk, who's away for uh, two weeks, he could come back to quite, to quite a penalty, at least in theory. Um, and then there's the correction process. And again, failure to submit to that, um, the fines keep mounting and mounting. Um, so this, yeah, it just seems like a lot. Uh, and I guess it brings me back to my basic question is, what is the problem that this is meant to solve? Is there suddenly an outbreak 
of nuisance properties throughout Amherst that we need this draconian bylaw to address? Um, or is this uh, reflective of a problem that we face in this town always, which is that any given fall or spring, there are going to be certain properties that are going to be a nuisance. And we have bylaws to deal with that. We have processes to deal with that. I'm really struggling to see how this is going to make any difference. I'm also struggling to see that there is actually a problem that needs to be addressed beyond the perennial problem that we have living in a college town. So if I can get those help, if you can help me with that, I can support this. But at this point, um, I really struggle to see um, the point of this. Jennifer. So yes, this bylaw is, the, the intent is to address those houses and they're in, an increasing number throughout town that have multiple violations and that's how they become a, a nuisance house. And the intent is a corrective action and that's, and I, Live, I represent a district with many houses that, you know, would have, I, I mean, I'm thinking of houses that fit this definition of nuisance houses and working with the, the owners, the inspections department, the police department works with the property owner and houses that were nuisance houses are no longer nuisance houses. So that's what this is trying to correct. And so what, okay. One loud party does not make you a nuisance house. You would receive a warning and hopefully that wouldn't happen again. It's when it becomes a chronic issue that would make you a nuisance property. So I don't think there's any question that there, the nuisance properties are an issue in our town. And this is a way to deal with them in a constructive way. The um, building commissioner came to many meetings as did the police chief. We spent, they are not, they do not want to issue multiple fines for hundreds of dollars. They want to work with those houses that have become a nuisance and help them not to be a nuisance. So I can't imagine any scenario in which someone would be hit with, you know, multiple hundred dollar fines for ice on the sidewalk. And I can tell you that the neighbors, they just want to, they want a corrective action. That's, that's what they want. And, and it works. And so this is just to try and strengthen that to deal with those problem properties. And the, again, the um, building inspections department and the police department are not looking to be draconian in, in any way. Pam. Thank you. Um, a good point was made that uh, the building inspector has health and safety codes that they can enforce. Um, the police has obviously can can go to, to noise complaints. Um, but this is a reminder that it's not just underage drinking that that disrupts the life of a neighborhood. It is it, it can be other other elements, other activities and and um, that affect the quality of life of your neighbor. So when you have, you know, underage uh, drinking is pretty, pretty clear. Um, but when you've got parking on the lawn that obstructs sidewalks and that after multiple iterations of requesting that those be removed um, and you don't get the action, each, each of those violations, there may not be a fine at all. It's just that you're, you're notified that you're in violation and those notifications and the count starts the clock essentially so that you you um, as a property owner are held more accountable even though there's the separation of you know church and state between owner and tenant the tenant rights are obviously very strong but but what we're hearing is that a good manager makes a huge difference in how the tenants operate. If it's an owner-occupied dwelling, there could be, again, issues with your neighbors that really need to be rectified. And, and bringing somebody to the table in a constructive way is the intent of, of this bylaw. And it gives the, it gives the authorities um, flexibility 
to go in different routes to address the problem. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to George's thing with an uh, issue about does it apply to people that are owner occupied? And the answer is yes. And it also applies to people who, for example, in my district, own an Airbnb that's regularly rented and regularly has parties of 200 people. And it's owned. We can't stop the ownership but we can certainly make it uncomfortable enough with fines that they don't do an Airbnb rental every weekend that ends up in a party of 200 people. That's where I come. I, I like the fact that this is linked to the rental registration. I like the fact that it comes back to the owner. And because up until now, it's kind of been, okay, here's your fine but we never really come back to the owner to be responsible for the property. Andy? Yeah, I was gonna say something similar, but to put a little starkle reflection on it, as I sometimes do, because uh, you know, back in the days when I was on a select board member on the uh, Campus and Community Coalition, uh, you know, the need for a nuisance house bylaw for really originated there because we were recognizing um, problems mostly that were alcohol induced at that time. Um, and uh, they, um, it was, um, it, the police were running into barriers of amount of fine that they, and the lack of being able to hold the property owner accountable if there was repeated uh, visits to the same house and uh, or same building. So it sort of arose from trying to find a way of addressing that and recognizing <laughs> that if it is a noise bylaw um, situation that's being uh, dealt with, that there was a uh, reality that if it was a low enough fine, that the tenants of the house may feel that the party is more worthwhile than the fine, and that the fine is just a cost of doing, of having the party, and uh, which is uh, buying the beer was a cost of having the party, and so that that was sort of what started the discussion that led to the original nuisance house bylaw, and I can't believe that those reasons haven't uh, continued, and that's why uh, Chief Ting is um, supporting the changes. Thank you, Councilor Lord. Thank you. First, I wanna say I haven't read this thoroughly enough and sat with it long enough to fully vet questions or know how I feel completely. I wanna thank Anna for bringing up some of those points. Mm -hmm. Really hit home to me. And before you brought up the Airbnb thing, I was having this idea about maybe instead of having a law for a law and fines, um, crest building. So repeat, repeat bad behaviors or repeat un, um, harmful behaviors might come from a lack of empathy, a lack of understanding. So I was like, what have we started to you know, build circles, really start to educate, try to like let you know what the impact. My five-year-old wakes up with anxiety when she hears the drunk people screaming at two in the morning. I, I In high school, I lived in townhouse on Meadow Street and every Friday and Saturday in the warm months, there would be 800 drunk college people outside my window. And um, I don't know, we just lived with it, you know, Hobart, Hoedown, all that. I'm not saying we should do that thing, but is there a way without adding more fines and penalties to um, try to work with people to increase their their responsibility, their collectivity, the community? Maybe not, maybe I'm a dreamer. But for the Airbnb thing, because if it's a different 200 people each time, maybe it's different for when it's used as a business. I don't know, I'm just thinking I need more time, but I just wanted to bring a little bit of that in. Thank you. I'm just looking at this, and Pat, you haven't spoken on this one yet. Thank you. Um, there's a lot that I support in this uh, bylaw. 
um, in the bylaw changes. But um, George got me thinking about something uh, and pushed me to look at an incident I heard about just today. What we were trying to do is to address both owner-occupied and renters. But almost everything we're saying has to do with renters. But to me, it is very important that an owner also of a property who is living there faces the same consequences as a, a renter. That feels important. My concern is, and what George got me thinking about, we have this list of bylaws, and we were talking about with, with Chief Ting about the flexibility. And I think that's a very good thing. However, if I relate to something that got told to me today, a police officer in our town I'm, I'm hesitant to, I'm trying to figure out how to say this because the person who it involved asked me not to specifically say anything. But the person, the, there was a black man, black resident, who went up to a police officer because something was happening. And the police officer turned it around requested his license, asked him questions that were inappropriate for the situation, called in to see if he had a record. I didn't see that happening with this bylaw, but I bet that same cop, and I have a lot of respect for our police department, and I think they know that, and I have a lot of respect for police officers in general, because my... Uh, that you were violating the way three hundred dollars versus fifty dollars if there is that kind of flexibility. It's really hard for me to believe that's potentially possible, but after hearing what I heard today and other instances over the years, we can't have a bylaw that makes it easy for people to be treated differently. So that holds in two ways. Property owner who lives in the property needs to be treated just like a renter. And at the same time, how much flexibility can we give po a police officer when we don't know how that, how that police officer's assumptions will impact her uh, ticketing? or her ability to respond in a human way to another person's agitation or problem. Alicia, you have not spoken. Um, thank you. I think that both, or uh, Councillor Ryan, Anna, Pat, and Hala have all vo voiced some of the concerns I wanted to share. I was essentially going to say that I think that the flexibility just allows for the possibility for in like inequitable enforcement um and that it just leaves too much of a chance in my opinion for discrimination of all different sorts in terms of the application of the enforcement um and it makes me really feel uncomfortable and so i do understand the issue that we're trying to address and the important the importance of addressing it and so i'm wondering if there's some other way that we can ensure that people won't be treated differently and won't be handed down different fines just to be punitive um and also just this notion of you know being a i, I was a young parent so my experience in this town has been very different um as i've moved and lived in different neighborhoods um, but one of the things that concerns me when we talk about allowing fines to be associated with noise is that noise doesn't always associate with parties and drunk people. I've had plenty of complaints about my kids playing 
like many, I've had the police called on me. And so like, what would happen yeah. if I could be handed down a fine because my kids are chronically too loud, even though we already have a bylaw, a noise bylaw that indicates between which hours that can be happening. And so again, like I just, I worry about the fine situation. I think when we were creating Cress and we talked about um, what kinds of calls Cress could be responding to, this was like noise complaints was at the top of the line of things that we talked about just in terms of the reports that the CSWG particularly got regarding the discrimination in how noise complaints were responded to. Um, and so I I would like to explore like a mediation process or, you know, if if the goal is changed behavior, I think sometimes it's important to understand that punitive control isn't the only way to incentivize changed behavior. George. So. I still struggle with this. I It's alleged that there's an increasing number of incidents. I, there's no evidence for that. None that I'm aware of. I'm, I'm happy to have some given to me. I'd like to look at it. I'd love to have Chief Tang come in here and tell me, oh, Councilor Ryan, in fact, you know, noise complaints is student, you know, this is this is a real problem and we need a tougher bylaw to address this. As, you know, uh, Councilor Todd said, uh, the current system actually does actually work. Um, you uh, they you identify these properties, you work with police, you work with the university, you work with uh, inspections, and the problem gets dealt with. It'd be nice if they never happened. It'd be nice, I'm sorry, uh, it'd be nice if you didn't have these incidents, um, but I'm struggling to see what the problem is that this uh, very forceful bylaw is trying to address other than that the current bylaws do not address. Um, the only thing I've heard that that catches my attention is, you know, Airbnbs. Um, again, I don't know how many of those there are. I don't know how many of them produce a problem. Um, I don't know if this bylaw is worth uh, in instituting just for that issue. Um, but I would certainly like to hear from Chief Ting that this is a problem that he's encountering in increasing uh, numbers, and he needs a more draconian bylaw to deal with it. And maybe he said that, and I just missed it. Um, but I, I'm not aware of it. And I'm certainly not aware of any evidence that this is a, a problem that's been growing and growing and growing. I do think the current process seems to work. It's not perfect, but there is no perfect solution to this problem. We live in a college town with 23, 24,000 college students. Um, this is a constant perennial issue. Um, why do you feel that the current bylaws are not adequate? Jennifer, it's your turn anyway. Um, so what I said is one of the most important parts of this bylaw is it is involving the property owner in helping to resolve the issue. And I have seen houses that have been year after year would fit the definition of a nuisance mm -hmm. property working with the owner or the manager. There are, it can happen where there's a will, there's a way to set stand, you know, say you can't have more than X, you know, can have a party with more than 50 people. But I have also seen houses in my district for 20 years, the same house has been a nuisance property because the owner has never taken responsibility for kind of lay, setting out expectations with yeah. the tenants. So it can work, but it also, because it doesn't, it isn't mandated we we need this for those houses that year after year, no matter who's living there. And I, you know, the the police chief came to many, 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 as did the building and um, building commissioner, more meetings than we wanted to impose on them. And they absolutely felt, with being a college town, that this was inappropriate. These measures were inappropriate, and they thought effective way to address those houses. And again, it's that year after year are problematic. Pat, maybe your hand should go down. Anna, you have your hand up? Covered the other side of my envelope. Okay. So I think the idea of recognizing folks who are repeatedly doing this uh, or who are repeatedly 
uh, breaking some bylaw in some way makes sense. And I see the corrective action plan part as something that really does set this apart from the other bylaws that we have. Um, I think for me, I, I do, sorry, uh, again, envelope method. Um, I am uncomfortable with the level of choice in responding. I worry that it allows for bias to impact response, right? Um, ambiguity breeds bias. This is where it comes in. And I think what I've heard from folks who have worked on this is that it's it's very likely the police wouldn't impose a fine the first time or wouldn't impose or, or things like that. Then we should write it that way, right? Like then it should say first time is the, is no fine. Second time is, is a fine, whatever, however that works. I think we need to be clear with what we would want to see, not what we would hope the response would be. I don't think that we should allow for ambiguity based on the situation. And then I still, and I, I would really, this is more my confusion. Um, I, I would love to hear an answer based on my reading. And maybe this is something GOL could have tackled. And if it is, I'm sorry, but based on my reading, a violation means creating a public nuisance, not being a nuisance property. A violation of this bylaw is creating a public nuisance. The penalty for violation is a $300 fine. So that's not just when something is deemed a nuisance property. It's when anything that is deemed a public nuisance in this bylaw is happens. So I would like some clarity on if this is double fining for things like a noise violation and then create, creating a public nuisance. Um, and if I'm misinterpreting that, I'd, I'd like some clarity because again, I'm pulling directly from it uh, on, on what the violation is and what the penalty is and what the definition of the, um, the violation is, a definition of a public nuisance is. Um, so I'd like to hear how this is or whether this is or is not double fining uh, for, for those violations. Councillor Haneke. Um, to address some of Councillor Ryan's- Can you speak a little closer to right. the mic? <laughs> to you. address some of Councillor Ryan's um, comments and then to piggyback on what Anna just said. Um, the current nuisance house bylaw, because that's what it's called right now, can create fines for two things, gatherings that include underage drinking, um, no, gatherings and then underage drinking. I think those are the only two things. Nothing else. If you do a noise violation repeatedly, week after week after week, the only thing the police or in a building inspector or enforcement authority can do is write a noise violation ticket. 300, 300, 300, 300. That's it. You could write 100 of them a year and that's all that can be written and they just pay it and there's no other penalty. Um, the goal here when it was referred to CRC, because it was referred for things and CRC looked at it and said, gatherings and underage drinking are not the only things that create nuisances. And so we were trying to go with what creates a nuisance and what would help uncreate that nuisance, if you think about it, correct that nuisance. And so the current nuisance house bylaw doesn't have a corrective action process. In fact, if you have a party with underage drinking every week, all you get is keep getting a $300 fine. After the third one, the owner might get the right. fine too, but that's all you get. No one ever has to do anything about it. If they're happy to pay the fine, they just keep paying the fine and keep having their underage drinking. And we want to fix the underage drinking, say, or fix the thing that's doing it. And so that's where the corrective action process yes. and that part of this new rewrite of the bylaw becomes extremely important. We're trying to make the owners and the tenants talk to the town and actually have that conversation. Because right now there is nothing in any of our bylaws that require whoever gets that fine to come and talk to us. They can just keep paying it. And they can keep doing their thing and paying their fee if that's what they want. They don't ever have to talk to anyone or fix anything. And so that corrective action process is one of the most important parts of this rewrite. Um, a court, you know, Anna asked about the double fining. Right now at a gathering, they can write if they deem it at 11 p.m. or midnight. It's a big gathering. It's got underage drinking. And well, because it's a big gathering, they say there's a noise violation. They can write a, public, a nuisance house and a noise violation 
violation. It's not double, even though there's two there, they violated two separate bylaws. And I see the inclusion of things that might constitute or go into a consideration of what a public nuisance is, is different than the bylaw that is set. Just, just a sole violation of, of noise on one occasion, while in and of itself doesn't, in my mind, create the public nuisance. Repeated of those violations, if they're there and they've been, and they, you know, they wrote that fine, they tried to undo the party, and then an hour later, the party's still raging on, then maybe we've got the public nuisance. Um, or maybe they've tried to correct that junked vehicle in an owner-occupied house three months in a row, and they've written all those tickets, and it's not being corrected, then maybe we move to the, you know, it's reached the stage of a public nuisance. Um, so I don't see it as double fining. Chief Ting would be able to def do it more, but I, I don't see it that way. I see it as sort of a separate thing that includes some of these things. We're just setting forth. We didn't have to cite bylaws. We could have just said, you know, public nuisances can include things like public urination and this and this and this in combination or alone, but over a course of a period, it was really hard to come up with a definition that kind of got to what we were doing but it as as pam said it's it's sort of ongoing issues at a house there might be a better way that this council can come up with that the five members of crc can't um or couldn't but but that's what we're going for that it's not just one instance of public urination but that public urination by three different individuals in accordance with, you know, in, in conjunction with a loud party at three in the morning um, that also includes parked cars all over the lawn, honking all over the place. Then maybe we're writing a public nuisance violation too. <laughs> so I hope that helps. Pam? I think, she, I'm sorry. I, I think she covered that pretty Thank well. Thank you. Jennifer? Yeah, I keep forgetting to add when I've spoken before that I would have, um, I would be supportive of taking out that clause in number seven that's offensive to community moral standards. Um, okay. And then I also just to piggyback on what you said about the Airbnbs, we really want to involve the prop property owner in resolving the issue. And like the Airbnbs, there are a number of houses that are owned by out of town investors mm -hmm. who just see it as a business renting out these houses and don't feel they have any responsibility beyond that to the community. Mm -hmm. So we want them to be involved in the corrective action plan right. as well. Right. George, you still have your hand up? Yes, I do. Uh, this is helpful. I realize that the, like any sponsor of any bylaw, you want all 13 or 12 of us or whatever it is, to just go yay and we just move on. But um, I'm sorry, I can't. But this is very helpful. And um, I know it's probably buried in here, um, but at least reading it cold as opposed to this kind of back and forth helps me see some of the issues that lie behind this. Um, I still uh, think would like to hear from Chief Ting and Rob Mora about their desire for this. Maybe they can just submit a memo. I don't, their time is precious. Uh, and maybe they've already done this, but, and maybe I can watch a tape of CRC, but I haven't seen them actually tell me or the council that they really think this is a great idea and help them. But I think what I'm hearing is they would probably say some of the things that uh, Councillor Taub and Rooney have said and, and, and Councillor Haneke. We're, we're particularly interested in properties. We're particularly interested in getting to the property owner. We're particularly interested in properties that where this is a repeated problem and we're trying to create a corrective process um, that might address it. Um, and so that I'm hearing um, and that, that helps me with this. Um, I still have some thinking to do, and I know we will have one more chance at this. Um, I don't know that I will, actually, I know I won't be here for that. Um, so that's a problem for me, but perhaps not for the sponsors. Um, but uh, I, it would be nice to hear from the two uh, authorities that they like this, but I appreciate the responses that you've given, and it helps me see more clearly why this is the way it is. I do find the number of $300 penalties somewhat uh, awe-inspiring in a not a positive way, um, but that's the way it is, I guess. Um, so, but thank you. Anna. 
Would it be appropriate to make a motion to strike specific I, I was just going to words? Uh, I was going to point out, thank you, Anna, for asking. We should do all of that next week. I mean, next yeah. time we meet, okay? That we do motions to change the bylaw. Great. And I think there's you're you're hearing a lot of support for the issue you pointed. Oh, out. absolutely. I just wasn't sure if it was appropriate to do it now or at the next meeting. We'll thank do you. it uh, when we come back for second reading. The other question I want to ask with if we're going to do second reading on the uh, next meeting and George, you won't be here. Uh, in fact, you might want to listen to the times when Chief Ting and uh, Rob Moore have come to CRC meetings. But if is there anybody else in the council that would like us to invite uh, uh, one or both of them to the next meeting? Please speak to your mic. I had I heard George, George say that he'd be happy if they just wrote a note to the council or something yeah. like that. The other thing is it feels to me like we've gotten a lot of information to think about in CRC um, with this bylaw. And maybe people could send us stuff so we don't have to keep this conversation going on. Um, or where do we're not referring it back to CRC. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is so unless right. somebody Never wants to make that motion. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. It's not a referral back. I mean, at, at this point, I'm not hearing that. I'm hearing a second reading. I'm hearing that we are definitely going to have at least one motion. I'm hearing that uh, there may be some desire to invite uh, both Chief, Chief Ting and Rob Mora um, because. Uh, TS, I mean, CRC has had the advantage of meeting with them, but the rest of the council has not. That's what I'm hearing. I, I also want to point out something. I think this is a wonderful example of what CRC does and what GOL does, because some of the people asking the questions tonight are on GOL, but their responsibility on GOL is different. And they come to the council now is when they ask questions that relate to the actual purpose, et cetera. So, um, Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, the only thing I was going to ask is um, you're talking about a second reading two weeks from now on the 23rd. And I'm wondering if we could have it instead be on the 7th, because I would like um, people in my district don't even know this is coming. And they probably stopped watching after we discussed uh, Trash Hauler, since that was the hot topic of the <laughs> evening. And Freka and I are trying to set up a district meeting. We don't know whether we'll get the room on the 22nd, but just to, to, to get a little bit more, um, my my district, by the way, has lots of these houses. Um, yeah. People can point them out. And the former town councilor, Sarah Schwartz, would talk about what happened to her property by being next to some of these houses in terms of the flow over into her barn and um, so forth. So it's it's this is of a concern, but I want to get a, a sense from people of the, this notion of that. Do they think this is enough? Is it a corrective action? Um, and just bring this to them. So my only question, Lynn, is do we have to have the second reading and a vote two weeks from now? Or could we have it on the 7th? And you're, you know more what you've got scheduled for each of these meetings. The reality is October 7th is much more flexible for putting something on it. And uh, George, will you be here for the 7th? Remotely, I can be here, yes. Okay. If you can deal with that. So I'm going to suggest that we do bring this back for its second reading. We do it on October 7th. We see whether or not Chief Ting and... Rob Morrow could join us and uh, that people prepare any motions if they can prior to the meeting and make sure that Athena has them. Pam, did you have additional comments? Yes, um, I would say if people have questions that would be appropriate rather than just mm -hmm. rushing forward with, with new motions, okay? Yes. Um, so it would be um, the CRC will meet and I think I'm I'm looking at Athena, but I, I think it would be appropriate if questions came to the CRC that we could discuss and answer them, uh, given the time frame of being pushing it out to October 7. It doesn't mean that it has to be referred back to CRC. And I would 
Oh, actually, not, not want uh, that. I don't think it has to be referred back for you to Good. answer questions. Yeah, we don't really want that. No. Um, I, I wanted to, though, come back to the question of, of concern about um, the the violations um, and and the concern by the community that uh, an officer might come in and issue a um, a permit, I mean a nuisance uh, violation instead of the the litany of uh, bylaws that are already on our books, and and to somehow come come in with a higher penalty than otherwise might be issued. Um, the the mass general laws. As, as Mandy said, we, we could have just not listed them, but it made sense to remind people that there are a number of bylaws on the books that affect quality of life. And, and so we sort of put them in one spot. Someone says, okay, what are, you know, what might constitute a, a nuisance? And if it's parking, it's it's parking. So so somebody the the building inspector comes along and and issues um, a fine for parking illegally, and this has happened three times in the last week on East Pleasant Street, which is in our district. And the first time the inspector came along and said, "Please move your cars." You're illegally parked. Just just take care of them properly. Nothing happened. They came back and they actually they actually um, ticketed them for a violation on the second. We've heard from the neighbor that the cars haven't been adjusted yet, and so this this continual iteration of of snubbing their you know their nose in the face of of the bylaw somehow has to get brought to the attention of the owner. And um, that really was the intent for, for making this somewhat more encompassing than just underage drinking and gathering. Um, so most, uh, and as, as Inspector, <clears throat> excuse me, building, building Commissioner Morris said, if we're going to ticket somebody, most, most of these items under Mass general law, for instance, um, are are things that are sort of health and safety related, and we would we would ticket according to mass general law. We're not going to ticket for nuisance property. It, it, that's just not necessarily a tool that we would think to reach for when we go to respond to a property. So it, it's it's trying to link the the quantity of violation um, and the iterative, iterative effect on on being able to control for the for the health and well-being and peaceful enjoyment of a neighborhood those properties so if I could leave it at that I just just for consideration Anna mine was not related to this topic I had a question about the rest of the agenda at that time. Let me get to that in a moment. George, did you have any other comment? Very quickly, perhaps the iterative and repeated nature could somehow be worked into this, and I will just send that hapless suggestion to you okay. at CRC. So see what you can do with it. I'm going to suggest the following. We are going to do the second reading of this on October 7th. We will reach, if Athena and I will reach out to the chief and to Rob Morrow, the in inspector, and ask them if they would be able to join us that night. If you have motions you want to make or questions, please send them to Athena and me. We are not referring this back to, G to CRC or to GOL, but the, between the two of us, we can probably come up with where those questions can best be answered, okay? Is there any other option that people wanna talk about with the, regard to this? Okay. Um, I've already, let me just talk about the agenda. I've already set, decided that we are not going to discuss town manager goals tonight, okay? Uh, and we will do that. But Anna, did you wanna delay the other one? 
Um, I was considering delaying the other one because it's 1045 and we still have committee reports, mm -hmm. uh, but it depends. I, I also don't want to be the sole person who wants to do that if everyone else wants to discuss it tonight. Um, so I was seeking opinion on that and I forgot what else I was going to say because it's 1045 at night. Um, oh, because I didn't know, I couldn't remember what the next agenda totally looked like and if it would fit on there. Um, the meeting in two weeks has a little more on it. If we needed to, we could actually bring this back to um, GOL and finish the pieces we didn't do. I would be comfortable with it yeah. being referred back to GOL um, because the version we sent had some formatting issues and things to adjust. So I was coming in with a heftier amendment proposed. Right. So if folks are comfortable referring it back to GOL to make those changes at the GOL level, um, then we could do that. I don't think we need an official motion to do that. No, uh, no, so. sorry. This is the, yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So item C under actions will not appear on the agenda again until the 7th of 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 October. Yes. What, let me just also say, when it comes to us, this is an opportunity to discuss what's in the charge, okay? The second thing is the presentations and discussions on the town manager goals. I don't know whether we'll do that on October 7th or on the 23rd. Uh, I'll just have to look at the agendas. Are there any questions about the action items? If not, we're going to move to committee and liaison reports. Um, and let me just call, make sure that you realize we've already done the minutes. And uh, Dave Zomack is still with us, is the acting town manager right now. And we will ask him if he has anything he wants to say. But let's go to CRC. Pam Roney, is there anything else you want to add at this point? No. Okay. Elementary School Building Committee. Kathy? I've been on mute. Um, we haven't met since the last time I told you we hadn't met. We we are due to meet on Friday, the 20th of September, and the bids are due back the day before on the 19th. So that's when we'll have news to report. Um, and so we're just waiting. Thank you. And thank you for providing that date. And so that means when we meet on the 23rd, you can share that news with us. You got it. Uh, Finance Committee, Kathy, Bob Hegner's not here. Yeah, you have a report in your packet. We had two topics that were the discussion of the September 6th meeting. One was an update on the Jones Library financing, and the other was um, some questions we had about the financial status of the Cherry Hill Golf Course. So as you'll see in the actual numbers, we... The information we got on Jones is basically financial. It's the same information we have had all along, starting back in 2023. So there's not been a lot of movement um, in the financing. Uh, there's still almost a $7 million gap. in if the price tag is 46 million in what the trustees need to, to raise to finance their share, one, issue that we explored is the new one that we've become aware of because the historic tax credits were turned down. There's been a question of whether the two big federal grants, the HUD grant and the NEH grant, which also have to have a historic review, um, are at all in jeopardy. And there's something called Section 106. So we ask questions about when is that happening? And the specific dates are in your packet. Um, the That review needs to be completed, and it's about historic preservation. That review needs to be completed before we can contract, the town can contract uh, with any bidder. And we don't know where the bids are gonna come in in terms of whether it's gonna be on target or not. So the timing of the bidding is now linked to when the section 106 review can happen. And Pam got some of this information, I know via the Jones Library Building Committee. So no Jones Library trustee came um, the to our meeting and the person who reported 
everything to us was the new finance director. And so she basically was on the spot for trying to answer questions that she didn't have answers to and got back to us on some of this timing. And that's not insignificant because it's over $2 million of grant money um, that to make sure we have that grant money, we basically have to go through that review um, at, and iron out that issue because otherwise those grants are potentially at risk. I'm not saying they are at risk, but the review has to happen. And the the federal rules are you can't contract for it. You can't sign the bids um, until you've done that. On the golf course, um, we, we asked for financial information because there had been a report um, actually the newspaper about um, a deficit that they were running. And the most recent numbers are good news that the revenues actually exceed expenses the way we count revenues, the way we count expenses. Um, and it, they've been doing a good job for the last three or four years on holding expenses down and revenues have increased. If you do a different kind of accounting, which we don't do for any department, and you put fringe benefits in, and you do whatever capital expenditures have come out of other pockets, um, the the surplus disappears. You know, so it's near to break even or not quite breaking even, um, but on the straight revenue versus expenses. So, I just I just want to raise that to everyone because when we look at a department, when we look at those budgets, they don't have. Uh, the roll up for benefits, none of the departments, the only place in our budget book that shows it is our enterprise funds. They do show the full what 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 is the labor cost of the people who work. And so there was a proxy for um, part, uh, the golf course employees on benefits. And during the meeting, the statement was, we're not even sure that those numbers are totally accurate because some of them are part timers and they don't get benefits. You know, we don't costs account it back down to the department level. So we spent longer on the golf course because we were getting brand new numbers that none of us had before than we did on Jones because they were numbers we'd seen before and there weren't they weren't being updated in any significant way. And that is all in the report. Our finance director did a great job, by the way, of getting back to us on some of the timing issues. And let me just mention that I, the town manager and I are meeting later this week, I don't even remember when, uh, with um, the library trust, board of the chair of the library trustees and the library director. And the topic, in fact, is both the environmental review and the 106. And uh, But every indication is that they will be completed before there would be a contract. But I want to ha make sure that meeting happens before we say that definitely, okay? And I actually think it has to happen before. It doesn't necessarily- It does, and it does have to happen before, and the way it's timed, it will happen before, is what I'm saying. Yep. Okay, Jennifer? Yeah, so this um, might be obvious, but so when the review happens, the determination is made. I, I, so I, we would, I'm assuming that we can't enter into a contract until we, the determination has been made as to the outcome of the review. That that that's that is my understanding, yeah. and I think Pam got some clarification of that through an email. But it's you know it's it, this is a, a virgin territory on some level because the federal process for this is a little bit murky. So we they advised us to hire a consultant, and I think we've got someone working with us with the town to make sure we do the review properly. Um, and there's a public comment. There's a public involvement. And they have all the documentation of what's happened. So, oh, so Jennifer, when that closes is not clear. You know, there's a target date for when that determination is made. I have two more questions. Yes. So, in terms of retaining a consultant, I'm just is so the budget for that is in the forty six point one million. I mean, that's why. I assume not, so. Nobody, they didn't. Have, town manager didn't have to come to us. I assume so. I also well, think that Bob Heron is doing some of the environmental. Okay. Yeah. Last question. When you meet with the library this week, mm -hmm. could you ask, because it's been brought up in public comment a number of times, inquire as to the $900,000? That... Yep. Yeah. Thank you. And report, and we'll hear back at the next meeting. Thank you. Would you please send that to me in an email as a question? I will. Thank you. Um, Jones Library Committee. Pam? Well, 
funny you should bring that up. <laughs> there has been no meeting. And so when I asked if we please couldn't have a meeting, um, it is actually going to be scheduled for the 17th of September, so a week from tomorrow. And, and again, have asked for a lot of this information. There may be some clarification of this Section 106 review process and the timing of it and issuing bids, going out for bids. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, TSO, Andy. Oh, did was there anything <coughs> else for Jones? Okay, Andy, TSO. It's really nothing that I have to add that wasn't in the written report. I want to remind you that the written report has one issue discussed, which will be at the next council meeting, uh, but it was reported in this one, and that's uh, the proposed uh, work to be done on West Street uh, from uh, Potline to Longmeadow. Okay. Um any liaison reports? GOL. I'm sorry. I miss GOL. I'm so sorry. You're all on a... It's okay. G uh, so based on our based on our discussion tonight, GOL will be meeting on the 26th. Um, we'll be discussing the uh, the successor body to the African Heritage Reparation Assembly. Um, given the fake out tonight where everyone read it and was prepped, if you have questions and you'd like GOL to discuss them, it would be great if you wanted to send them to me. If you want the um, exciting moment of, of keeping it at council, that's fine too. But uh, we because we will be discussing it on the 26th, please send me any questions that we might be able to handle or any changes you wanted to see that we might discuss um, if, if you are so inclined. And that's in regard to the church. <laughs> Correct, in regard to the charge. So GOL will not be meeting um, before our next meeting on the 23rd, but we will be discussing this on the 26th. Thank you. Did I miss any other committees? Okay, liaison reports. Any? Seeing none, uh, we've done consent agenda. Uh, David, do you have anything you'd like to share with us tonight? Sure, thanks, Lynn. Uh, given the hour, I'll be very brief. Um, you mentioned the block party coming up a week from Thursday. We're very excited about that. We had some very productive meetings today with uh, the bid leadership, with public safety, DPW, health um, inspection services. So everything is lining up for a week from Thursday. We hope it's going to be a great event. Uh, weather is always the big factor, and we're keeping our fingers crossed that we get, there, get weather next week like like expected this week. So uh, clear temperatures and, and sunshine. So we're expecting a great event, um, and um, we are getting, we will work with the bid on social media posts over the next couple of days. You'll see that kind of ramp up, so we get the word out both on our website, the bid's website, and with participating agencies. Um, uh, Paul should have uh, information coming out on the next steps with the VFW process. Uh, you may recall we had that very successful meeting some months ago with the Narrow Gate. They're the architectural firm that we hired to do the conceptual uh, rendering and conceptual narrative around uh, what could happen on the VFW site. We had over 55 people attend that meeting and uh, they have uh, they are very close to finishing their work. And so we will be bringing that, that information back to the community. Uh, this will be a Zoom meeting. That meeting was actually in person uh, in the town room. I know some of you attended that, but this will be a Zoom meeting coming in, up in the next three to five weeks. So we'll get you information on that. I think Paul will also have some updates. Um, actually, there aren't too many updates, but we're awaiting updates on the Mass Works grant for Emony Street and U Drive. Again, we submitted that some months ago. That was for the roundabout, you may recall, the proposed roundabout there, sidewalk and uh, streetscape improvements. So uh, again, we're, we're, uh, we're hopeful on that grant. We also have a couple of other grants that we did. You may recall, Paul reported that we did put in a very large design grant for improvements to the Puffers Pond Dam and Dyke, and we're still waiting on that. I think that was north of of $500,000 for that work. So again, um, we feel 
Those were excellent. Both Amity Street and the Buffers Bond Grant were really solid proposals. So we're keeping our fingers crossed on those. And then lastly, um, I will save myself an email, but while the, this meeting has been going on, Guilford and his staff have been doing um, uh, double duty down on a water main break at Amity and U Drive, right near the, the proposed roundabout. So Guilford, you might have seen him working his his uh, phone or or computer while while you were discussing um, uh, topics earlier tonight. So there is a water main break down there. Their DPW crews are out um, doing what they do best, which is you know uh, fixing these problems with our aging infrastructure. So uh, they're working on that right now. So those are the four or five quick updates. Happy to take any questions on those. Um, and we're looking forward to Paul coming back later this week. Thanks, David. Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, Dave, uh, you you may or may not be able to answer this. So just uh, uh, let Paul know I've asked it again. Um, when you mentioned the Amity roundabout, I had asked, uh, what about the intersections near the Fort River School? Mm -hmm. And Guilford has been working with a consultant. And Paul, Paul said, we do have options and he was going to bring them to the council. And I, I, I realize one has been on the list for a really long time and the school is on, but to me, it's a huge priority to at least get that in motion. And I don't know where that is. Those options, um, they're already, they are ready to go. And, and yeah. we've been talking with Lynn about that. I believe we're going to preview those on the 23rd, but I'll let Lynn fill you in. Yeah. Kathy, good good segue. Uh, there isn't a written president's or vice president's report, but let me just mention on the future agenda items. I already mentioned the master plan primer, the public forum, and the regular meeting. We start at 5.30. That will be uh, Chris Breastrip's last public meeting with us. Uh, we will be discussing just hopefully briefly, the proposed timeline and process for the town manager's evaluation process. I doubt we will do any goal work. Uh, we will not be doing nuisance bylaw. That's now on the 7th of October, but we will be focusing on a number of public way issues. One of them is UMass, a UMass sign request. Another is the Fort River and Southeast Street traffic and road improvements. Another is potentially something about school safety zones. And then separate from that, is the potential of having the university drive overlay proposal that's coming from the planning board come to us. Okay. A uh, lot of, that's one reason why I'm trying to shift some more things to the seventh because I already know this agenda is packed. The two appointments we know of will be the CPAC and the Board of Health and they're with uh, TSO at this time. Are there any counselor comments? Councilor Ette. I'd just like to call attention to um, one of the comments that we had earlier this evening in public comments. I think when we have public comments and we as a council do not respond, there's the appearance as if a lack of response implies either agreement or at least some acquiescence to what has been said. And this particular comment has to do with the town manager. I choose not to repeat what was said, except to say that when we use these kind of remarks, what they do is they muddy the water in the conversations that we have in town, and they reduce the credibility of those who make those statements. About six months ago, I remember in this very hall, someone making a statement about a counselor being Clarence Thomas and Herschel Walker. There's only one person who could have fit that description. And I was unable to respond and no one in the council made mention of it. And I wish that when we hear some of these comments that in some way are unpalatable, outlandish, whatever you may describe them, we can call attention to them without having to deal with the veracity or whatever else might be made regarding the statements. 
Thank you for your comments. Are there any other comments at this time? I'm going to make a motion to adjourn and seek a second. Second. Thank you. Um, we're going to do a quick roll call. I can find the thing. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to start with myself. I, Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner's absent. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Rette. Aye. It's unanimous. The meeting is adjourned. It is 11.03.